So good morning, everyone. So welcome to the second session of the WhatsApp with Malidov Mass Spectrometry in Microbiology. Welcome to the new participant. Welcome back to all the people who were here, here yesterday. Uh, so for people who were not here yesterday, um, I'm Oren Fischerl, and I will just host this session uh, today. Um, so like yesterday, we're still pretty international with a lot of people. Uh, before to start, I would like to thank all the speakers to be here, uh, really a uh, great person. Um, also, for your information, uh, the session will be recorded and then available later. Uh, so, um, also, if you want to ask questions during presentation, please write it down in the chat and then you'll just read it at the end of each presentation and then speaker will answer it. So. Um, Today, our uh, session, uh, we have five presentations with uh, two keynotes. Uh, today's session is really uh, focused on um, parasitology and uh, viruses. So uh, let's jump into it. So our first speaker is uh, Dr. Markus Tink. Uh, so um, he has a PhD um, in molecular ecology at the University of Osnabrück. Um, he worked at the German Institute of Food and Technology where he focused on the implementation of biological um, methods. And he is working with Brucker since 2009. And he focused on the analysis of mycobacteria by models of mass spectrometry, library extension and subtyping functions. So Marcus, um, the floor is your for a presentation. Have fun. Thank you, Maureen, for the kind introduction. And uh, today I'm talking about the Malditoff MS in regulated food market. And I want to give a short technical outview. So. So let me start with the Mali biotyper milestones. Uh, the first systems were placed in routine laboratories in 2008 with first multinational and multi-center studies, which were performed. One year later, the IVD system was launched and in 2013, the FDA clearance of the Mali biotyper CA system was achieved. Um, sorry, this uh, figure collapsed a little bit, but what I want to make clear is still visible. Um, the question was, which guidelines to follow? There are some standardization organizations like AYC or ISO. There are certification bodies as well, AYC, Microval, AFNOR. And of course, there are states which issue laws and rules for regulation. In addition, the guidelines to follow should uh, cover at least the European and the US region. And for the European region, most of you know the uh, ISO 2073 from 2005, which has an Article 5 with uh, specific rules for testing and sampling. And the blue mark means that the use of alternative analytical methods is acceptable when the methods are validated against the reference method in the ISO standard 16140. And on the right side is this ISO standard part six, which is for the validation of alternative proprietary methods for microbiology confirmation and typing procedures. However, when Booker wanted to go for a certificate in food market, it was 2017. And at this time, only the part one and the part two of the ISO 16140 were already published. And the part two 
is for the detection and enumeration of microorganisms. But what about the confirmation and typing methods? Let me explain the difference between confirmation and identification. The confirmation is a procedure which is carried out to verify a presumptive result. And this means it is a binary scheme. It's positive or negative. It can be, for example, a salmonella isolate or a non-salmonella isolate. In contrast, the identification yields the identity of the analyte and is an open test scheme. It can be, for example, in salmonella or Klebsiella oxytoca. So the part six, which was published end of 2019, is for the uh, alternative methods. And to make this complete, part three, four, and five were also published recently. So we worked according to draft versions of this ISO. And this was, of course, a risk because if the finalized version would differ from the draft versions, maybe the data were not sufficient. For the United States, the situation was more clearly. There's the AUAC, well accepted, and they offer microbiology guidelines with an Appendix J. And the Section 6 is about confirmatory identification methods. And this standard provided the technical rules requirements to select the strains, run the testing, and the data interpretation. Now it seems as we were caught between two tools, the ISO and the AOAC. But luckily, they share the same principle. They're based on two different studies. And the first study to perform is the method comparison study, or a pre-collaborative study, which will be performed on numerous target strains for inclusivity testing and numerous non-target strains for exclusivity testing. And this is to assess the reliability of the method, and it has to be performed by expert labs. The second part is an interlaboratory study or a collaborative study with a restricted number of target and non-target strains to assess the reproducibility of the method. And therefore, there must uh, be included many different operators, different instruments, different materials, so that a minimum of at least 10 valid data sets is necessary. All these studies have to be summarized and provided to an expert panel, which reviews and took a vote finally if these data are acceptable or not. Booker performed four method comparison studies to detect Salmonella or to confirm Salmonella, Chronobacter, Campylobacter, Listeria, and in particular Listeria monocytogenes. The study included two instruments, two types of targets, the steel target and the bio target, different culture media, and a huge number of strains, 150 for inclusivity and 100 non salmonella, for example, for salmonella, which means uh, the exclusivity strains. And in total, more than 21,000 samples were analyzed. As most of you know, for the research use only field, the influence of media is low. And these are all Pseudomonas olivorans mass spectra cultivated on different media. And indeed, the log score is almost identical for all of them. It ranged between 2.49 and 2.52. And for the species identification, the media 
have no or almost no influence. However, in the regulated market, all the media used must be included in the studies. So there were different selective media included to offer a flexibility to user to use different media. For example, for Kampailobacter, these four media were included and uh, covered by potential certificates. The results of these method comparison studies were very good as the inclusivity and exclusivity acceptability limits were all met. So the next step was the interlaboratory studies and again the same target analytes were included but a much higher number of collaborators up to 17 labs. In contrast, a lower number of selective media and of course the lower number of strains for inclusivity and exclusivity tested were included, but almost or more than 6,000 samples also has been analyzed. So in total, more than 27,000 samples were done for these food studies. And the interlaboratory studies results also met the acceptability limits. These data were provided to the microvial committee. It is um, a committee which decided that these study data met the ISO 16140 part 6 standard. And finally, a certificate or four certificates were achieved, which are for the confirmation of the different genera included in the species, in the, in the studies. And these certificates are available on the website of this certification body. Same was done in the United States and the AOAC Technical Committee approved this data and there are two certificates, one for the gram negatives and one for the gram positives, also available on their web page. And uh, this would be a nice moment to stop the presentation because the certificates were achieved. And two points can be added to this to this uh, milestones. 2017, at the end, the AOAC OMA approval was achieved, and a few months later, the ISO 16140 Part 6 validation by Microval. But time goes by, and hardware developers are also busy. So a new multi-biotyper Sirius 1 and Sirius system was launched in the last years, but they were not part of the food studies. The Sirius 1 and Sirius are compatible to the existing MBT software, MBT libraries and workflows. Advantage the minimized waiting time are the times from docking to initialization and the time from docking to be ready. And this means that the volume must be exited of the system and the high voltage is turned off. So this means faster sample to measurement time. In this table, and the pictures show the different systems, and the Sirius and Sirius 1 have a different cover and electronic parts. But the main aspects like the vacuum system and the laser are the same as in the 
Multibiotyper Smart, which is uh, a part of the certificates. The Multibiotyper Sirius has one special additional feature, and this is the negative ion mode. This is a plus for the research use only. And I want to give you some examples about this negative ion mode. Because this uh, broadens research applications, for example, in the analysis of lipids. The um, For example, the detection of cholestine, as we heard yesterday from Marina, in Akinobacter baumani or in Salmonella enterica, and um, such an example is uh, shown here. This is a negative ion mass spectrum, and it's an E. coli susceptible, cholestine susceptible strain with a lipid A peak. And the resistant ones here, MCR1, is, um, has a uh, changed lipid A because it, it adds phosphoethanolamine, which has a mass of 123 Dalton, and then next to the lipid A peak, the peak with lipid A plus the phosphoethanolamine appeared. And so you can predict the cholestine resistance. Another example is in the field of microbacterial envelope lipids analysis. Two references are given here, and these mass spectra from 800 to 3000 in the negative ion mode are from the same species, Mycobacterium tuberculosis. And the upper one from the subspecies Canetii, and the lower one from the tuberculosis variant Bovis BCG. And these negative ion mode mass spectra differ clearly. However, come back to the regulated food market, we decided to perform a study to demonstrate equivalence of the zero system the former smart system. Again, with the claimed genera and species, with different preparation methods, which are the direct transfer, extended direct transfer, and extraction method. So, total 4,800 mass spectra were acquired. And the criteria of this study, of this equivalent study, was to have the same proportions of high level confidence identifications, which means two or higher of the log score value, and the low confidence and the no reliable identification proportion should be equivalent. And finally, the log score values also shall be equivalent. All these data were summarized in a Hooker internal report, and this table 11 gives the log score values for the different genera achieved with a smart system and with a zero system. And they are, in my opinion, not only equivalent, they are almost identical. So the equivalence of the Sirius platform to the MVT smart system was demonstrated. The software must keep pace with the hardware. So I want to tell you a little thing about the new software called MVT Compass HT. HT means high throughput and it uh, has a new 
modern graphical user interface and the calculation of the identification results is much faster. The aim is to have the identification one available a few seconds after the mass back for our position was done. And for the food market, this new software was compared to the current software with more with 600 different mass spectra acquired in this food study and the log scores were identical so we uh, issued a statement of equivalency for the mbt compass ht and mbt compass in food analytics workflow All these data, again, were submitted and presented to the technical committee of Microval, and they accepted, and I want to enlarge this small white. And now you can see that the Microflex LTSH, MBT Smart, and the Sirius One and Sirius are now part of this certificate here exemplarily shown for Salmonella. For the AOAC, the data were also presented to the technical committee and orally they agreed, there were no dissenting votes, but they need some time for proofreading of the data and for publication process and so we're expecting that the new food certificates from AOAC will include the MBT Sirius, MBT Sirius 1 and the MBT Compass HT software. So before I close, I'd like to thank my former colleague, Daniel Zuhir, who was strongly involved and organized all the studies and I want also to thank my colleague Olaf Degen, who's now in charge of all these food market requirements. I thank the collaborators for performing the study, and I thank you for your attention. So, thank you very much, Marcus. It was really, really interesting talk. I think it's Great to have an update on what's going on on the broker side and uh, all the data of technologies. Uh, so, so far, there's no question in the chat. Luckily for you, uh, I have a question for you. Uh, okay. Maybe it's a, bit, it's a bit beyond the scope of your presentation. So, you introduce a negative beyond mode on the new uh, Sirius uh, biotyper. Uh, so, you just describe that it can be used for uh, the resistance of the collagen. Um, but uh, do you know there's maybe over application than antimicrobial resistances with this mode? Um, yes, I think so, because um, it is um, it analyzed a complete uh, different spectra of molecules, and these uh, negative molecules, which are part of the uh, outer cell wall or membrane are completely different than the ribosomal proteins analyzed in the positive ion mode and so th these uh, antibiotic resistant detection is just one example as well as to differentiate closely related species and I think or I expect if um, this technique will be made available to more researchers that there will um, come up a lot of other applications for this. Okay, so in the meantime, we just receive a few more questions for you. So we get one from Isa, we were talking a bit later. Uh, what are the advantages of the negative Young method compared to the positive Young method in terms of, in terms of typing? Oh, the advantage is that it is uh, the, the different set of molecules. If, 
if there's no chance to differentiate something within the positive ion mode, maybe there's one in the negative ion mode because as I um, you know, just told you, it's the, the, the lipid around the cells which are uh, measure and uh, they differ more than the ribosomal proteins. Mm. Uh, also, we get a question from Jörg. Uh, how do you respond to the new taxonomic changes? Um, in the field of microbacteria or in general? Because, it's not um, okay. Uh, in general, um, we keep up with the actual nomenclature by checking. Um, publications, internet sites, like NCBI taxonomy browser, to keep up with this. But uh, for the microbacteria, there are four new genera described, and this is not clearly accepted by all the experts. Indeed, some uh, experts in this field published a paper which is against the acceptance of this new genera, and so um, because of this, we stick to the actual or the, the former uh, species uh, genera names of microbacteria, because um, it is more accepted at the user sites. Okay, so we get also another question from Jindrich. Uh, the new Compass HE software is not compatible with the Compass Explorer software for uh, REO uh, application. Is Bruco working on new Compass Explorer software and when will this be released? Um, the first software versions will be the real-time client and the Explorer is um, planned to be released but first we start with the um, everyday usage software for identification so first the needed software versions and maybe a year later or some years later the explorer will also be available but this is a planning Okay, and so one last question for you, Marcus. Uh, it's from mm -hmm. Belen, who talked yesterday. Uh, mm -hmm. Group talk, Marcus. Is there a standard protocol available for the analysis of lipid using the Cyrus 1 system? Um, up to now, there are some publications available, but of course, we're also working on the protocol. But as this is a very new research field, we are still working on it. But yes, there, there will be something available soon. Okay, thank you, Marcus. So once again, thank thanks you. a lot, Marcus, for your presentation. It was really interesting and like you see a lot of uh, interrogation with this new biotyper. Uh, so, but we need uh, so far to move on on, uh, on the agenda. So thanks again, and so we're gonna go to the next presentation. Thank you, Maureen. So You're welcome. So the next presentation is the one from uh, Dr. Maureen Laroche. Uh, so she is a medical entomologist from uh, Martinique, from the French Caribbean. Uh, as a trained bacteriologist, she is mostly interested in bacterial pathogen transmitted by arthropods and in developing new tools for vector surveillance. So for the past year, she has been developing Malitov mass spectrometry profiling approaches to identify arthropods, their build meals, their age, but also the pathogen that they carry. Um, so Maureen Storm is going to be a keynote, so you should be um, listening to it. Really interesting talk. So Maureen, the floor is yours. Thanks, Maureen. Thanks for the lovely introduction. Um, yeah. So 
as Maureen said, I'm a medical entomologist, so I'm a bit of an outsider here. But as you will see during my presentation, Molotov has been used more and more extensively in the field of uh, entomology. So what is medical entomology? Uh, starters, it's a discipline that is focused on the study of arthropods and insects that are impacting human or animal health either by their simple presence uh, because they're present a nuisance or because they are transmitting pathogens. And uh, those that transmit pathogens are called vectors and they are usually um, imaginative, sorry, not a bit of lag between the slides. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so those vectors are usually hematophagous arthropod that will ensure the active transmission of a pathogen while active because it's not just a syringe effect of pumping some infected blood and, and, and transmitting it to another receptive host. Uh, there are some specific interactions that are happening between the vector and this pathogen. And uh, just a few more definitions. An arthropod, of course, is an invertebrate animal that uh, has an exoskeleton, a segmented body, and a pair of jointed legs. And those what we'll be mostly talking about are the arachnids, uh, mostly ticks and chiggers, and insects such as mosquitoes, fleas, uh, lice, etc. So uh, the base of all that is that there is no vaccine for most vector-borne diseases. So if you want to address this issue, you really have to tackle it at the source and do some vector control. And vector control requires extensive knowledge uh, of the vector itself, but also of the pathogen that are associated with it. And so all our access of research in medical ontology kind of revolve around that. But our two big ones would be the development of new tool for arthropod identification, because you can't control something if you don't know what it is or um, if it's even there. And also the use of arthropod as a proxy for monitoring uh, vector borne diseases, as I was just telling you, you have a specificity between the host, uh, the, the vector and the pathogen. And this allows us to infer the risk of transmission of vector borne diseases. So uh, this is what we'll be talking about today, uh, how we use Molotov filing for identifying insects, uh, for detection of the pathogen, the vicari, and also uh, to identify their blood meals. So I always like to put my acknowledgements a bit early while everyone is still awake. And in this, in this thought, it makes a lot of sense because as you will see, I'll present quite a bit of data and all this data was generated by so many different people, mostly students I've worked with or supervised. Uh, so I just wanted to thank uh, this group of people. So let's start with the identification of vectors. So um, we all, of course, have tools, other tools to identify insects. Uh, one of the main one, the gold standard, will be morphological identification. You are using um, supporting documents that we call morphological keys, and you look at specific criteria that will allow you to narrow down what you're seeing to one single species. Uh, but this is this has serious limitation, especially since in entomology we are dealing with what we call species complexes, which is a group of species that share a very similar or identical morphology. Or you can receive damaged specimens. Uh, of course, no matter how good you are, if you receive something that is completely crushed, uh, you won't be able to identify it. If you have a sample that is immature or engorged, uh, the morphological criteria can be absent at that time or distorted. And even if you are in ideal conditions, you still need quite a bit of uh, entomological expertise. If you look at those two bugs here, uh, you can look at them quickly and say, oh yeah, that's the same thing. Uh, it actually isn't. Those are two very different triatomines that are competitive for the transmission of a parasite uh, called Trapanus macruzi. And one of them, Renus Alexis, is actually one of the main vectors why the other, Renus robustus, is, um, is not so much important in the transmission or his vector uh, competence is much lower. So it's really important to know what you are dealing with. So we, of course, use molecular identification, and it's, it's quite straightforward. It would seem like it. You can start a DNA, you sequence a uh, portion of the genome, but already this is complicated. There is no universal gene for the identification of arthropod. So you still need quite a bit of expertise to know which gene you're supposed to target for this genus, for this species, and sometimes just two species uh, are of uh, one specific genus need to be a sequence using a specific gene and a specific region of that gene. And if you don't have this expertise, you might be uh, doing an additional experiment and ending with uh, nothing at all. 
uh, aside from that molecular biology can be lengthy, uh, it is definitely expensive, the running costs can be crippling depending on the, the kind of lab you're working in, and you are also dependent on the database. Uh, the problem with GenBank is that um, you have to trust what is put there, and sometimes the reliability of, uh, of the sequences is questionable, but sometimes the sequences are just simply not there. Um, so I'm not going to go through again what Maldidoff is, uh, it's the second day of this conference, so I'm just going to explain to you the specificity of the workflow in entomology. So first, we only work with high quality spectra, and um, what can impact the quality of a spectrum be the quality of the initial sample, of course, uh, and how it was preserved, if it's a very fresh sample compared to something that is super dry, or preserving alcohol for an hour or 10 years, uh, of course, this is going to impact uh, your the, the, the resulting spectrum. And you need to adjust your protocol to address this. And your protocol must take into account the preservation, but also the type of sample, uh, all this to obtain usable spectra. Once you have that, you need to check intraspecies reproducibility and interspecies specificity. So it's a mouthful, but it is actually really simple. It means that two different um, species will have different spectra and the same species will have the same spectra. And this is prerequisite. Um, you need all this uh, before going forward. After that, you can start building your database that will be composed essentially uh, of formally identified samples. Uh, so if you are trusting your morphological identification 100%, you can base that morphological identification, but usually we prefer something uh, more unbiased, uh, such as molecular biology. And the remaining sample can be used for querying that database, uh, what I'll refer to on was a blind test. And you can have two outcomes. Um, your samples are successfully uh, identified, which means that first you develop a protocol that uh, allows you to generate reference spectra that help you identify uh, similar species and similar sample, or um, you can have a negative income uh, outcome and uh, your sample gives you unsatisfactory long scores. Uh, and this can be either that your protocol wasn't suitable, it doesn't allow you to generate reliable reference spectra, or just simply that the samples you queried have no counterpart in the database. So uh, we decided to start with ticks a while ago with Amina, and we had all those ticks on the left in our insectary, and we decided to try on legs, wild legs, because first thing we wanted to do is exclude in the abdomen, because this is where the blood will be, and we don't want any contamination of our spectrum with our host proteins. And the legs were really suitable because it leaves us a big portion of sample, either to repeat the experiment or to do additional experiments. And here you can see our uh, our first or first try with uh, two important vectors, uh, Isodus resinus, uh, which is the Borrelia species that are responsible for Lyme disease, and Amblyomma variegatum, uh, which is a tick that is mostly associated with Rickettsia, uh, which are small intracellular bacteria, and this one especially uh, Rickettsia africae, which is an agent of fever in tropical areas. And what you can see is that the spectra of Isodus resinus are really reproducible, the spectra of Amblyomma variegatum are really reproducible too, but the two species provide different spectra. So here we check intraspecies uh, reproducibility and also interspecies specificity. And it works so well for all uh, those ticks mm -hmm. that it's now routinely used in some clinical labs, especially the lab uh, I, I, I was in a few years ago in Marseille. Uh, they published the results uh, of the identification of ticks and also the pathogen they carry, uh, ticks that were actually removed from patients, and it's actually the technicians that are identifying those ticks using Malditov. So you can see you can end up in this kind of situation when we you get a sample that is so damaged that even the greatest entomologists can't do anything with it. Here the, the head is missing, and the head is uh, really a major uh, body part for tick identification. And turned out it was Isodus resinus, which I just mentioned as a major vector, so it was really important to know uh, what kind of tick we were dealing with. So we kept working on ticks. Um, this is the work of Adama. He brought tick from Mali, but this time the ticks were in alcohol. So we had to find a suitable protocol. And he tried two things. Uh, one side, he tried decreasing, uh, successive bath of decreasing concentration of ethanol. And on the other side, he tried to incubate the tick legs in a dry bath at 37 to uh, let the alcohol evaporate into 
dry the ticks a bit. And it turns out the, the, the dry back was the best solution and it managed to obtain those really nice quality spectra that you can see here that allowed the detection uh, of all the species you brought. In, uh, more recently, we did the same kind of work with Meji that brought so many ticks from Algeria. And you can see here that uh, he also had different, a lot of different species. Some of them are really uh, tricky to identify. And um, what was really interesting in it is that first he managed to get specific spectra for all of these, but he, he had so many samples. Uh, it was really important to find a tool that would allow you to uh, do that in a cost effective way. And uh, you can imagine that if you have more than 2,500 texts to identify, even uh, see if you are doing morphology, it's going to take so long and there will be potential mistakes. And uh, if you are doing molecular biology, it is going to be extremely expensive. So it was really nice to have that tool uh, that would allow that to do that at, at lesser cost. So this is a lot more recent. Uh, this will actually be published this year, uh, hopefully. And this is Jack's work. He's been working on ticks from the southwestern region of France, especially around the city called Nice. And what you can see here is that he had all these tick species that provided really nice uh, models of spectra that allowed him to identify more than 99% of his uh, of his specimen. And why why this is really important is because like uh, here you can see the gene the, the different genera, Ixodes rubicephalus and uh, uh, Hemophysalis at the bottom. Those are really uh, challenging genera. Um, to identify using morphological identification because within that gen this genus you have uh, so many tick species that look like one another. So it's really important to have a tool that allows you to uh, accurately identify them. So it was working quite well uh, with ticks, so we decided to try with mosquitoes and because we had so much success on the legs, we decided to keep working on the legs and we were successful again. Uh, quite lucky, we had really nice spectra from so many different species of mosquitoes uh, and each species were providing specific spectra. We're even challenged by uh, another team um, from Sweden. They sent us blindly uh, quite a number of mosquitoes and turns out using Melbourne we managed to identify all of them. This is a bit more recent. Um, so I did this work with Andrea, who at the time was a PhD student in Sydney. And what is really interesting about this paper, so it, it, for starters, like in Australia, they really need uh, good uh, vector surveillance, especially mosquitoes, because they have incursions of mosquitoes uh, from all the ports and everything. And also, they already have some species that are competent for the transmission of mosquito-borne diseases, uh, even sometimes the, the pathogen is not there. And so we collected more than 20 species, well, the, the, the Australian team. And first we did some molecular biology. Uh, we used a unival, universal mosquito gene. There is no such thing, but the COI is usually uh, what we use to identify mosquitoes. And here you can see that COI here wasn't able to distinguish our uh, Culex vitrinus molestus from Culex from fasciatus. Uh, I'm not saying that it's impossible using molecular biology. I'm just saying that if you are doing it uh, simply just taking the COI, uh, you are going to face challenges. Uh, but what is was really nice is that using models of those two species were perfectly distinguished, and you don't have to uh, have this this way of thinking that I mentioned earlier. Saying, okay, I have those two species, I need to find out with pair of primers, or I need to use for molecular biology. For models of it, it's the same um, sample prep, and and it allowed us to identify everything without any ambiguity. So um, we also tried on mosquito larvae, which is uh, of course really important because when you, in the spirit of suckling things at the source, uh, ideally you also uh, manage the larvae. So you just collect the larvae and the larvae will be green inside, but uh, you need to know what is there. Uh, you need to know that in this larvae will be inside, you need to target uh, all potential vectors. You, you need to know what you're dealing with. And we were quite happy to see it work. Uh, and much more recently, we decided to push things a bit further. Um, we wanted to see if Molotov was able to distinguish different colonies from the, from the same species. And um, to, to do that, French Polynesia was uh, really ideal because you have the mosquito species that are going to uh, 
expand from one island to different uh, neighboring islands and we end up with mosquitoes of the same species but building their own uh, island colonies. Uh, before we get to that distinction, we decided to just have a look as if, if, if Maldotov would be able to distinguish male from female mosquitoes. And any entomologist, entomologist would be just looking at it. That's, that's a bit used, but it's very easy to distinguish a male from a female. But the thing is, by doing so, you allow someone that has no entomological training or to, to distinguish the sex of a mosquito. And of course, it's really important for mosquitoes since only female uh, feed on blood. And also, you end up, especially with mosquito, often in the situation where some body parts fell at the bottom of the tube. Uh, so if you end up with a mosquito without a head or without its antenna, it's really nice to have an additional tool that will still tell you if it was a male or a female. So here you can see that all the different colonies that we had included in that study and uh, some of our insectary mosquitoes are not shown here, show the same thing. You can really distinguish male from female mosquitoes and the difference is mainly uh, it's on the intensity of the peaks. The profile are really similar, but the, the female usually have some peaks that are a bit more intense. As for the strains, you can see that we managed to differentiate different colonies of each species that were included in that study. So this PCI is a bit messy, but when you do a blind test, uh, Molotov classify the, the colony uh, properly. So um, we were feeling quite confident and so like, okay, let's, why not try fleas? So we took the legs and the fleas and uh, it wouldn't work on the legs. Uh, we had to start over and, and find out which body part would work uh, for the flea. And turns out the whole flea without the abdomen was the suitable uh, body part that allowed us to identify those species. And a bit later, uh, Antonio came from Spain with uh, a bunch of fleas preserving alcohol. And we're really, again, feeling really confident because we had graded our protocol. We used to crush the fleas with pestle, but now we have developed an automated um, crushing method with a tissue laser and glass powder. And we had the dehalkalization protocol that I mentioned earlier that Adam had developed on ticks. So we just thought that we could just merge this and we would have something that would work on those fleas. Uh, well, it didn't. So we had to find a new protocol that would allow us to uh, identify those fleas. And it turns out the major change was like we switched uh, the, from the, so the, the soft crushing of the glass powder to a uh, more intense crushing with tungsten beads. And uh, we managed to have really nice spectra here um, that led us to have some really nice classification in the sense that you know that a dendrogram is not a phylogeny tree. But in this case, for species of fleas were perfectly classified according to family. And what was really nice is that we managed to differentiate Clancivides felis, which is the cat flea, and Clancivides canis, which is the dog flea, although the cat flea ends up often on your dog, but anyway. Um, what was it? Those two fleas are quite difficult to distinguish. So if you don't have entomological training, uh, making that difference based on morphology will be very hard for you. And even using molecular biology, uh, you can face some challenges as you really need to target a specific gene and a specific portion of that gene. And even on GenBank, the, 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 the sequences are quite unreliable because people at, that um, submitted those sequences didn't necessarily identify those fleas properly. So it, it was uh, really interesting to have a tool that would make all that much easier. We uh, also tried with sandflies and um, so again we went for the legs and, and, and it didn't work and, and it's really important it was really important to find a tool for the identification of sandfly. If you've never seen a sandfly, it's extremely small and the identification, the morphological identification is based on the genitalia, so the reproductive system of the sandfly, which is of course internal, uh, so you have to mount the sample. And um, it, it basically is just a pain and it was really nice to uh, have something that would again make things so much easier. Here you can see that the, the species that we have included that are factors of Leishmania, uh, which is a neglected tropical diseases found in tropical countries. And I'm pretty sure that if people had a more affordable and easy way to monitor uh, Leishmania through sandflies, uh, it would change a lot of things. So uh, this is something I did a while ago um, on triatomines. You remember I showed them earlier. And 
first thing was we had to we had to find a core body part. And if you remember, uh, we've been working on the legs so far, although it didn't really work uh, for for fleas and sand flies. Uh, but here, one leg of triathlon is already much bigger than a whole mosquito. So we we had to adjust. And turns out the the femur of the the median leg was ideal. Uh, so we extracted the proteins, checked the quality of the spectra, and we're like really nice spectra from that body part that was really specific of each species. Those are vectors of uh, Trypanosoma crazy, the parasite that caused Chagas disease in South Africa and Cent uh, Cent uh, Cent Cent South America and Central America. Um, when we did the blind test, after creating our, our database, we had 100% of accuracy. And what was really nice is that we managed to differentiate Rhodipomolixis and Rhodiospobrestis, which are the two triathlon that I showed you uh, on my very first slides, um, that have very different factor capacity in regard to trypanosoma crazy. Still on hemipterans, uh, one that you know a bit better, I think, uh, bed bugs. Here we have the two common bed bugs, Cimex lectularius, that you will find in temperate regions, and Cimex hemipterus that you will find in tropical regions, although there is a bit of overlap uh, for those two species. And uh, of course, you know that they are a major pest. They are not necessarily attracted, or not at all actually, to, to, to dirty places. They are just attracted to you. So you will find them in your home, in trains, planes, hotels. Um, and they are known in laboratory settings to transmit a few pathogens, but there is no epidemiological data that is supporting the fact that uh, they might transmit those pathogens uh, in the wild. And as you can see, the, the distinction of those two species uh, is just based on the measurements of the pronotum. Uh, here, it, it seems quite obvious, but when you're working on such a small insect, it can be really difficult, um, especially when you are working on several hundred of samples that are a mix of those two, uh, it, it can be uh, really challenging. So we, we, we tried different protocols on bed bugs and you can see in blue that the legs didn't provide really nice spectra. We had quite a bit of noise. Uh, we also tried the, the cephalothorax, the head and thorax, and the head alone, and both those body parts gave satisfactory spectra. We ended up choosing the head because when we were doing queries, the head was providing higher log score values. So you see here on the PCA that Maldotov is really able to distinguish uh, Cimex lectularius from Cimex hemipteris and also male from female. And what I want to show you, don't be scared by the table, um, we worked on quite a bit different strains. So we had lab strains and wild strains from different continents. And what you can see here is that we, um, we had correct identification of the origin of each colony. So the same as mosquito, you can use bed bugs, you can use Maldotov to monitor uh, which kind of population, uh, which population of bed bugs you are dealing with. So um, that was what was really interesting in that paper. We also work on lice, and uh, as you can see here, they really look a lot like each other. So these are animal lice, uh, apart from this one that is a bit Darth Vader-like, but uh, Lice identification is so challenging. Uh, first, if you are doing molecular uh, morphological identification, you need supporting documents, and those supporting documents are rare, or when they exist, they are difficultly uh, accessible. Um, also, in molecular identification, there is this dogma that a cow will only have these species, a sheep will only have these species, but imagine if your sheep is having some fun with your goat, uh, I can imagine that it can share some lice. So we need something that is a bit more robust for the identification of lice. And uh, what this work showed us is that molecular biology was really unreliable for the identification of lice. So we tried two cuts, uh, a longitudinal cut of the whole lice, louse, uh, and you can see that the, the spectra was, were really not usable, but we also did transversal cut uh, where we separated the abdomen from the thorax and legs, and this was uh, much more satisfactory. And we, it resulted in all in different spectra for all these species, uh, spectra was specific for all each and every one of these species, and it was uh, really important. Uh, this work was probably one of the most challenging for um, as I was saying, we had nothing to rely on. Uh, Basma really struggled to acquire a document that would help us identifying the, identify those lies. And at some point, we almost gave up from some, for some species and decided to rely solely on molecular biology. And what we saw is that the, the, the sequences were either not there, it was the case for so many of those uh, lie species, 
uh, or just completely wrong people uh, submitting sequ sequences of poor quality of sample or samples that were inaccurately identified in the first place. Um, so it, it was really challenging, but now it, it is uh, really nice to have this tool that will allow us to identify all the species without all the limitations of the other techniques. So I mentioned earlier that we use arthropod as a proxy to infer the risk of transmission of vector-borne diseases, but at some point you really need to know what is there if the samples that you are studying are indeed infected by some pathogen. And the first person who attempted that using molecules was Pogelia Fetsu-Fetsu. And um, as you can see here, what he did is he showed that there were specific peaks that were appearing uh, on the tick spectrum whether it, when it was infected. So we kept working on this approach and so that it was also true for Ekezia. When the tick is infected, you have modifications of the spectrum, uh, which includes specific peaks. Um, so we decided to attempt that on the detection of plasmodium in mosquitoes. So of course there are existing methods for it. Uh, so usually you identify your mosquito using morphological identification or molecular identification with the limits I mentioned earlier. And then for the detection of parasite, you, you either use molecular biology or uh, immunological methods such as ELISA, uh, which is also presents its limits since if you are working on something quite exotic, uh, you might not have the proper antibodies, or you can also deal with the, the cross reactivity of antibodies. But even if you're fine with all those limitations and it's not a big deal for you, you still need to go through those two steps, identifying the mosquitoes on one hand and then detecting the parasite on the other hand. Um, so I wanted to develop something that would allow you in one shot to identify your mosquito and tell if it was infected or not. So we did this whole experimental model when infected mice and we fed mosquitoes on those mice when they presented gametocytes. That you can see here, those gametocytes are the infecting, the infecting form of the parasite for the mosquito. And we classified the, the obtained spectra from mosquitoes according to infection status. So we did some molecular biology to uh, confirm the infection status. And what you can see here is that if we superimpose the average spectrum of infected versus non-infected, you have several distinguishing peaks that, uh, that reflected really well in the blind test because we we're able to identify more than 98% of the samples according to their infection status. So we, we, we kept going. And we also did that on fleas. Uh, here, uh, cat fleas were infected with Bartonella, which are small bacteria that will um, target your endothelium and also create, um, provoke some, in some cases, endocarditis. So we cut the flea in half. Uh, one half was used for Molotov and one half was used for PCR to confirm the infection status. And what was really interesting in that case is that we ended up with three categories. The controls, we had just been fed non-infected blood, but also the exposed fleas, which had um, been exposed to infected blood, but cleared infection. And of course, the infected fleas that were exposed and PCR positive. You can see here, same than the plasmodium, you have very distinguishing peaks in the scoring position of the average spectrum of the two different categories. Here in that gel view, it shows you the results of when we also worked on Bartonella in Simex uh, Reclois, which is the bed bug. So if you're not familiar with, with gel views, uh, it's basically a stack of all your spectra. And if you have a peak that is uh, preserved throughout all your spectra, you just have a straight line. Um, so here you can see that you have some peaks that are specific to the infection of Porto and La Quintana. Uh, sometimes it's just a matter of intensity, but sometimes it's a, a completely new peak. And what is interesting also here is you have a peak that is specific to the, the, the control, that is like additional to, to the others. And it's really counterintuitive to, 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 to imagine that the controls might have more peaks. But what happened is that when an, an alphabet is infecting, infected by um, whatever pattern that we actually transmit, there is some innate uh, immunity response to that infection. And it sometimes entails down regulation of the, the vector protein. That's why you can end up with additional peaks in, um, in a control sample. And finally, I want to talk to you about blood meals because uh, it seems agnostical, but it isn't. Uh, if you are dealing with a vector, uh, you really need to know what it feeds on because the risk, of course, isn't the same if you are dealing with a mosquito that is just feeding on your cow or a mosquito that is feeding on that cow, on your sick dog, and then yourself. 
So you need to know what kind of factor you're dealing with. So the first person who did this was Sira Magnave from Mali. Uh, he actually fed anopheles mosquitoes, um, the vector of malaria. And after 12 hours and 24 hours, he looked at the abdomen and uh, generated spectra. And what you can see here is that he got really nice quality spectra from the engorged abdomens and that those spectra were specific of uh, the host he had fed the mosquito with. And uh, so we added more, uh, sometimes quite exotic species. And although you can, you can, you could think that those are really similar, uh, they are actually quite specific to the blood source, especially in the first peaks here. This is where you would see uh, most of the modifications. And um, but this isn't as simple in nature. When you collect a mosquito, you never know if it. Uh, the, the blood that he has in stomach was his first blood meal, or if it's a normal mosquito that has fed seven times before. Um, and also, we have what we call interrupted blood meals. So basically, mosquitoes try to, to, to feed on you, you feel it, you try to, to kill it, of course you miss, the mosquito uh, flies away and finishes blood meal on a dog. And so the, the result will be that you will have mixed blood meal, uh, mixed blood in his gut, your blood and your, your dog's blood. Uh, so the way we, we mimic that is that we fed the mosquitoes mixture of blood, either human and, and sheep, human dog, or let, 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 let's be crazy, human dog, sheep. And uh, we couldn't just feed them uh, successively in different hosts because technically you don't know if 100 of your mosquitoes will feed on the first host and 100 of, uh, of, of them will feed on the second host. So we needed to make sure that mosquitoes had fed uh, at like both blood meals. And uh, so he left them for 12 hours, retrieved the abdomen, crushed it in formic acid and acetone nitrile, uh, created the database and processed the sample ID. So I'm not going to, to comment the results based on the tables that are in the paper because you're going to want to quit the call, but I'll, I'll tell you what was interested about, interesting about it. First, the successive blood meal. Um, it, what happened is that you simply identify the latest blood meal without any impact. Uh, of the previous blood meal. So this was really easy. Interrupted blood meals was a bit more tricky in the sense that um, if you want to identify them, you need to have that mixture as a reference spectrum in your database. Because of course, uh, if you have a dog human spectrum uh, and in your database, you only have dog and human separately, the mouse dog won't be able to tell you, oh yeah, this is a mix of both. You'll have to pick one of those two. Um, so you can put a ratio 50-50, it is fine. We actually tried several ratios for the queried samples and they were all quite all successfully identified um, using one reference spectrum uh, of 50-50 ratio. Of course, uh, if the ratio is really imbalanced, if you have a mosquito that fed on 90% one host and 10% the other, there is, it's very likely that the Molotov will um, match with the most abundant blood source. And what was really uh, interesting about this all as well is that we used three different species of mosquitoes, uh, two that were from the same species complex and one other that was quite different. And um, it, there was some significant overlap between the species of the same complex, meaning that if you have your database build on one species from that complex, it really helps you identify blood meals uh, from mosquitoes of the same complex. But the other mosquitoes was uh, Aedes albopictus, um, which was really different from our database that was built on Anopheles Gambier, couldn't be, the, his blood meal couldn't be identified. So we had to create an additional database for Aedes albopictus. And, um, but it's okay because it's so easy to share spectra by email or supplementary data. And also it, 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 if it works within a species complex, it, it helps you a lot. If you're working on malaria, there are like two main complex, species complexes that you're interested in. So if you have one or two species, for each of those complexes, uh, you, you've done uh, a big part of the job. And um, and the other, you just have to, to, to build it or ask people to send it to you. So it is, it, it, it's not ideal. It would have been great if you like, one database could identify all the blood meals uh, from all mosquitoes, but it, it's not uh, the end of the world either. You don't have to build one from each and every one, um, each and every species. So um, if you liked it and you want to hear more about it, there are two really nice reviews uh, that have been published on the subject. So the first one is 
are really interesting in the sense that it, 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 it was published by the person who was really a pioneer in that work and that's where you will find all the challenges of developing that, that method uh, and just simply developing something that is really new. And, and the second one is also nice in the sense that uh, it's really recent, it was published this year, so you will have a nice summary of everything that has been done uh, since that first review and how the things have evolved and all the new things that we can do uh, in entomology with Malditov. So that's it for me. Uh, I'll take any questions and uh, if you have them now and if you wake up in two days uh, realizing that you have a question then you can uh, always send me an email or if you want assistance to develop databases um, we'll be happy to help you as well. Uh, thank you Maureen. Thank you very much Maureen. I mean it was a really complete presentation and you're definitely not an outsider in this symposium. I think you're perfectly fitting um, the, the workflow of the, um, of the stipendium. Uh, you're not an outsider because we have a lot of questions, in fact, for you, a lot of it. So I'm not even sure we have time for all the questions. Um, so there is a first one from Natalie. Hi, very interesting. We, knew, uh, we know several users around the world develop protocols and libraries. You showed it very nicely. Uh, where libraries exchange via Compass Explorer export import feature to see if libraries seem robust and if profiles are similar enough wherever around the world. So, uh, I'm muted. No. <laughs> so we we didn't uh, import um, uh, reference spectra. We were lucky enough to have our own samples uh, that came from so many different countries. So we were able to show that um, the spectra are robust enough to identify mosquitoes from another uh, geographical um, um, location. Sometimes uh, you, so you will always identify the species, but then you can push it uh, to the extent of identify where, where it's coming from. So, um, and then we, we share as much possible uh, our reference spectra. For example, the paper that I shared on Australian mosquitoes, you can just download all the reference spectra from my paper. Um, so that's how we managed to compare, uh, decompare thing. And we didn't use Compass Explorer. Uh, we just, we just using Biotyper and creating our own reference spectra. Okay, so second question is from York. Uh, are the database of the research groups combined? If yes, how is this organized? Um, yes and no. So basically what happens is that we are uh, collaborating with other research groups by uh, hosting their students to be trained uh, in my past laboratory. So this is how we, we ended up having uh, so many different samples from so many different countries because we have someone coming from an exotic place and, and uh, asking to be trained on Malditov and you, that's how you generate um, those reference spectra from those species where this person is coming from and then they can just leave uh, with the database they've created. Okay, so next question is from Claudia. In which extent differs the spectra from adults and larvae? So I assume that you mean mosquitoes. Uh, they were really different. You can't identify an adult mosquito based on the larval spectrum and vice versa. Uh, yeah, they, they were completely different. And even when we worked on um, triatomine, we saw that we were able to distinguish uh, the different uh, matrix stages of, of the triatomine because uh, the larvae had a different spectrum than the adults. Okay, so there's also a question from Isa. Very nice presentation, great results with flex, but did you use another part of the body for your ticks or mosquitoes? If so, were there any differences? Yeah, that's a really nice question, actually, because when we did the work on uh, Plasmodium especially, uh, we bumped into an issue. We couldn't distinguish uh, non-infected versus exposed mosquitoes. And we don't do that because in exposed, you have those two categories, those who are accurately uh, actively infected and those who are just being exposed and clear the infection. And what we wanted to target was the actually infected mosquitoes. So we switched from the legs to the cephalothorax, which is where the sporozoites are located. And uh, we had quite nice results. And I know that there were some teams that are now uh, switching to cephalothorax of mosquitoes for di different reasons, because this is mostly where the pathological agents uh, are found, but also because legs are so fragile that sometimes if your samples are 
uh, stored properly, all the legs would have fallen off and um, you won't have much formaldehyde. Although endocephalothorax is of course uh, often still there. So uh, it, it works quite well. I know that some other um, teams also use the head decapitulum of the tick, uh, which seems to be working as well, but uh, this is not something I've done yet. Okay, so yeah, I think last question, there's many of them, so I think Maureen, you have anyway all the questions in the chat, so you can read it or answer it later. Uh, we have one from Valérie. Are you aware if any work has been done on mice? I'm interested in demo decks. Yeah, so um, it, it, is, it is really challenging uh, because mice are so small, you um, you still need to know what you're working on to be able to develop your database. So the, the, the challenge here is to find a way to develop that protocol that still leaves you a part of the sample for uh, regular identification. Uh, morphological identification of mice is, is, is complicated uh, because of the lack of supporting data and also all that you need to, to set up to do that. And molecular biology is still also, is challenging for so many different reasons. The, 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 the sequences are not necessarily available, but also you have so little material that extracting the DNA for, from a mite um, is, um, it, it is challenging. Uh, you get some DNA, but sometimes it's, it's not enough to do, to do sequencing. So um, I, I have preliminary data on, on, uh, on mites that I can't share here. I can tell you like it, it is worth it. You can, uh, you will suffer a bit, but it is, uh, there are some promising data. So we can, um, we can talk about this uh, off chat and maybe a bit later, but um, yeah, happy to help you. Okay, thank you very much, Maureen. So don't hesitate to answer to people privately of all the questions that you just received and I didn't ask you. So thanks again. And I think we need to move on a bit on the schedule. So uh, here it's time to bring uh, anything you can drink, coffee, tea, uh, because it's coffee break right now. So we will be back in a few minutes. So see you in five minutes.
So welcome back everyone. So I hope you had some time to grab some coffee or tea because we are reaching the last part of the symposium. So our next presenter will be Issa Sif from uh, the Institute of Medical Microbiology and Hygiene from Thailand. Uh, so he's an assistant research scientist at the Institute of Medical and Microbiology and Hygiene in Ombo, Thailand. Uh, in Germany. He held a Master of Science in Clinical and Environment Microbiology from the University of Lorraine in Nancy, France. Uh, his current research pertains to the identification of helminths of medical and veterinary importance by using a uh, mallet of mass spectrometry. So, Isa, the floor is you. Enjoy your talk. Isa, we can't hear you for some reason. You should unmute yourself first. It's unmuted. Are you able to hear me now? Yes, yes, perfect. Thanks. OK, great. <laughs> great. Um, thank you so much for your introduction and for the invitation. Um, it's a great pleasure to take part in this uh, online seminar uh, symposium to speak about um, the application of Malditov um, as a new tool for the identification of filaments and uh, today i will particularly uh, discuss about the identification of trematode species and for that uh, i will take two examples the first is a fascia species with uh, some data um, which are all already published on the microorganism journal related to the identification of adult fascia using Malditov. And second of all, I will uh, show you some data not yet published related to schistosoma. So as a background, fasciolysis is a foodborne parasitic disease um, mainly caused by two species like fasciola hepatica and fasciola gigantica. It was previously estimated that around 2.4 million people are infected in more than 70 countries. The life cycle of the fascia species are quite uh, complex and require uh, intermediate host. Um, schistosomiasis is also a um, tropical disease caused by a um, uh, parasitic worm called schistosome and um, it was estimated that around 240 million people are infected in around uh, 78 countries um, around the world. This, um, the life cycle of these um, parasites uh, is also complex and um, it involves uh, humans, uh, fresh water and snails. So for the diagnosis of these parasites, the current technique used um, uh, are the parasitological method for the detection of parasites and eggs in stool or urine. There are also immunological or serological methods for the detection of antibodies or antigens, and also a quite sensitive method like PCR, but these methods also present certain limitations. So here you can see a brief description about the multi principle. I'm not going uh, into details because it's already done by the previous um, speakers. For example, a few minutes ago, um, Maureen described to you that for, for example, species that are not included in commercial release, the database, you need to create your own reference spectra and establish your own database and for comparison for identification each, each, each single spectra need to be compared to the reference to the reference spectra and according to the result and the log score value you can make the different interpretation according to the score values 
So for for the workflow, uh, the objectives will be to acquire at first spectra by uh, Malditov using a quite simple protocol. Second of all, to create reference spectra and establish a, an in-house database. And finally, to evaluate and validate the, the database by doing a blind test. So for the first example of Fashola, we used um, a total amount of 86 isolates, including these two main species. And after spectra acquisition, we randomly chose the seven uh, isolates to create reference spectra. Replicates also were realized to ensure the reproducibility. These these specimens were the, the the species of these isolates were confirmed by PCR sequencing, and the result uh, here confirm well the species. So here you can see the protocol that we used for multi analysis with regard to the um, facial identification. For the used part, we cut a very small part here of the interior of the posterior end of the worm, and uh, we um, homogenize using with uh, water and ethanol, following by a step of centrifugation and removing the supernatan, and then after we add the formic acid and acetonitrile to extract the protein and then start the measurement by Maldi. So here you can see a representative uh, spectra, spectra profile of the, um, the of the fascia isolates and here you can see the first uh, samples of the, of the hepatica species and here at the bottom correspond to the hepatica then you can see uh, differences with regard to the to the two species so a closest look we can see uh, that some peaks are present here that we cannot see in the in the in the other isolates so by um, realizing a clustering analysis by a dendrogram we can see the clear separation of these two species and also in the intra species we see some intraspecies variation because of the of the clustering we can see with a certain distance these two groups are are um, separated so um, with a statistical test uh, we also confirm this this clustering by doing a pcr and a discriminant analysis the hepatica is here and clearly separated to the gigantica and the, also um, the intraspecies, uh, um, the intraspecies variation is also confirmed here. So um, for the validations, um, we use the same part like the posterior part by analyzing new fresh uh, samples, and we can see here that around eighty. 98.7% uh, were well identified at the genus level with score value above 1.7 and around 41% were identified at the genus level. And if we look at this, uh, the, the second species, uh, Fasciola hepatica, we can see 100% of correct identifications. And that for the second step of validation, we use another part of the body uh, of the worm here you can see the the body part that we use is the anterior part and the msp created with the posterior part was also able to identify other part of the of the world and um, next we also tried to identify uh, the eggs coming from the from the adult worms and uh, we also estimated the concentrations. And um, for uh, 38 isolates used, we uh, um, we used 10 of them to create reference spectra. And then here you can see uh, the spectra profile coming from the eggs. 
and for the validation of uh, of the x um, by using the x we can see here at first we just acquired the spectra coming from the s by uh, compare to the database containing only msp coming from the adults that we can see that the msps like the reference spectra coming from the adults are also able to identify um, spectra coming from the X. That means probably there are a lot of common peaks between the X and the adults. And by increasing, by expanding the database, by adding new uh, spectra of the X, we can see that 100% of correct identification. Now we can go um, for a second example of a schistosoma. Um, here, um, for the schistosoma, we also analyzed adult worm, and a total of 98 adult worms were isolated from mice. And also, uh, you use the different storage solution, as we know that the preservation solution can can affect the the, the spectra profile. You can see probably some differences on the spectra profile. So we used male, female, and also both larva because of the adult worm. You can see that the larva, the male and the female are paired. So we created MSPs for the, uh, for, um, the adult worm that are, which are paired. And um, we used here the same protocol um, for developed for the fasciola and um, for the blind test result here you can see that the adult worms stored in ethanol was correctly identified at the genus level with score values range from 1.81 to 1.96 and for those stored in RNA later also uh, correct identification of um, 100 percent correct identification was obtained so if we uh, do have a look on the um, and see it on the next slide here uh, on the spectra profile we can see some differences between this uh, the spectra uh, on the spectra between the samples store in ethanol so for example if we do have a look here we can see that this peak, for example, is present and it's absent here. So um, let me go just back one second. Uh, here we can see that the spectra, the result that we obtained, the score value with the sample stored in RNA later are um, higher than the score value compared to the score value than the sample stored in, in, in ethanol. So, um, uh, in conclusion, we can say that um, the anterior part as well the uh, posterior part of the adult worm can be used for multi identification, and um, that the uh, Fasciola gigantica X can also be identified with MSPs created from adult worms. And um, adding new MSP from the X allowed better results with higher log score value. The, uh, for the schistosoma, the adult worm can be identified by Molditov, and the storage using RNA later, the storage solution of RNA later achieve better results than the storage in, in ethanol. Um, uh, just um, before um, finishing the talk, I will just uh, um, give thanks to all our partners and also the list for giving us the opportunity to to present our work in this nice, very nice symposium. Thank you so much for your attention. So thank you very much, Isa, for your wonderful presentation. So we have a questions from Marcus, who just gave a talk uh, earlier. Uh, a potential question, the log score threshold based on bacterial species, was it usable for nematodes as well, or 
is or was it necessary to adapt the score threshold for trematodes and nematode species? Okay, well, um, nice question. Uh, um, at the beginning, we used this, this, the same score value uh, which were developed for bacteria and we were able to discriminate the species regarding these guidelines established for bacteria. So maybe we, 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 we do that for the trimeter species. Maybe if you use other species, maybe you have to adapt your score range to, to be able to discriminate your species. So as far that we were able to discriminate our species by using the same thresholds, that's why we go through it. Okay, so there's no more question from the chat side, but I have uh, two questions in fact. So the first one, so you work with elements in general. Did you try with other elements like Kenya, uh, Strongyloides or? Yeah, yeah, we are working with other other helmets actually. We are working with also helmets coming from not only relevant helmets, only medically relevant helmets. We are also working helmets infecting uh, also only animals. Uh, actually, we have some data with uh, also tinea, some cestod, and other like cestod only infected animals called the Tizenesia or Monesia. We also have some data uh, uh, um, for uh, other nematodes like Ascaris. So we are working with other helmets, yes. Okay, and last question from my side. Uh, you worked with Schistosoma. Uh, so you work with the, the whole world, but did you try to work with serum, for example? Yes, and <laughs> nice question because um, we also tried to uh, work with the serum samples, but it was the, 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 it was very complicated to get something reliable related to the to the to the um, to the serum samples. It's not it's not it's, it's a little bit different if you compare uh, the ESS, um, like the 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 biomarkers, for example, that you identify for your first ESS, the second ESS, maybe you cannot see the same peaks it's really very yeah it's very 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 complicated with working with the serum and maybe we need more developed protocol more reproducible protocol for that okay well thank you for your answer uh so thanks again for your presentation it was really interesting and still in the um, in the scope of uh, more in presentation so I suggest that now we just move to the next presentation. So thanks again, Isa. Um, so our next presenter will be uh, Dr. Kathleen Franks. So uh, she's a microbiologist and bioinformatics uh, product specialist, uh, and she has worked on improving bionumeric software from Biomedia based on customer insight and supporting customer to analyze their data with uh, the highest efficiency. Uh, she was closely involved uh, in the development of European Foodborne Disease Surveillance Network, starting based on uh, PFGE and currently uh, transitioning to the whole genome sequencing. So after eight years of experience in analysis of whole genome data and mainly technical customer support and scientific communication, Kathleen joined uh, the Biomaria industry unit to apply her knowledge of public health strategy to improve food safety in the processing environment. So Kathleen, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Maureen, for your uh, nice introduction and also for your invitation uh, to uh, participate into this uh, conference. I guess I am also really an, an odd one out because I don't have any data of myself to, to show you. I don't have any results that I can present. Um, but I guess what my goal is, is to convince you that you can also do this type of work that you've seen the presenters doing. You can also uh, contribute to see what is in, in your species, in your field, um, even if there is uh, not a lot of knowledge. Um, and I would also like to argue that um, a deep biological understanding 
of your uh, field of research is much more important than, than a deep understanding, a uh, deep mathematical understanding of the an analytical methods. So you can also do this type of things without uh, having a, a degree in bioinformatics or, or in mathematics. So I would like to start with the slide that Alex also presented. So on one side, uh, you can see that if you have different species, uh, typically the, the patterns are really different. You can already see by eye uh, that these patterns are different. Um, and you could probably also uh, just compare them to a database visually and, and get the right identification. It's just a lot of work and it can take a long time. So here analytical methods have the main advantage that they just allow you to be quicker um, but they're not necessarily more correct uh, than than just a visual uh, comparison of the spectra then on the other side we have the spectra of the same strain here you can see there's a there's much more um, similarity between the strains and, and any signal that would differentiate a, a specific phenotype or a specific strain is, is much more hidden. Um, and what I would also like to uh, note here is that a lot of the pipelines uh, that are used in, in the software for species identification and, and uh, the workflows for species identification, they are optimized for species identification and this already starts in the peak detection. So the peaks that are detected with those pipelines are aimed towards differentiating between species and not towards differentiating between phenotypes in a species or, or strains in a species. Um, so if you want to do something else on, um, on your spectra, it is important that you start from the raw spectra, then you will get the most uh, reliable uh, results. So here I show you an example. So as you see, we have two different species here and that's already something that you can very obviously see. The big uh, peaks are really different. They're really not the same. But uh, what if you have now want to distinguish between several different phenotypes. For instance, here, this dark green one, it's a different phenotype compared to these two uh, light green ones. And the same in this species, the light blue one is a different one. So is there anything specific for, for those? And typically, if there is, then we see that this is a much more... Uh, my last animation seems to have disappeared. But the signal here is much more subtle. Uh, for instance, there is a difference here in this smaller peak that is shifted. But you can see that um, here it's actually even below uh, the peak detection limit. Uh, so it's not detected as this peak, it's not marked. And for the other set, uh, there is a signal here. But again, you can see that the peak is not always detected by um, the pipeline meant to detect the species uh, specific peaks. Then um, what is very often used is just a dendrogram on, on the complete peak list. Uh, luckily a lot of uh, the presentations here already use different methods so I'm, I'm very glad about that. Um, but still in a lot of papers you just see the dendrogram with in, in a lot of cases just a more or less arbitrary cutoff based on, on the visual uh, interpretation of, of the groups. Um, this is a, an okay method if your spectra are really different, but if, if your signal is, is quite uh, small uh, compared to the complete spectra, if you just have a few peaks that are specific, then making a dendrogram on, on the complete uh, spectra will not give you a lot of information. And it's not because it doesn't cluster together on the dendrogram that there is no signal that is specific uh, for a certain uh, group. So I would also like to give you a bit more background information of what a dendrogram is exactly so that you can understand actually where it can fail and where it is uh, good to use it. So if you have a set of spectra, 
um, you will first calculate the similarity between all the different pairs of spectra. So you can use different methods to do that. You can base it on the entire spectra. You can base it on, on the peak list. You can also base it on a subset of peaks. So that's uh, um, there, your, your choice is free. And then once you have the similarity matrix, then you will use that to calculate the dendrogram. And the dendrogram will actually each time merge the highest scoring pair here A and B together and it will update the similarity matrix with in case of a UPGMA the average score uh, of this pair. So for instance for C it scores uh, 77 and 78 percent with A and B so the average will be 77.5 in the new updated uh, similarity matrix and then again it looks for the highest scoring pair in the updated matrix, merges it together, and so on until everything is merged. So you might understand now that this dendrogram is actually just a simplification of the similarity matrix and it does not contain the same information. I no longer know uh, how close C is with either B or A, just how close the pair C and D is with the pair A and B. So I lose information in a dendrogram. That is a very important concept to understand. This also means that the dendrogram does not always represent the complexity of the data very well. So this is an example, for instance, where one of the peaks uh, has a bit of a fluctuation in the intensity, and I use the entire spectra to calculate the dendrogram. Um, there, the middle one, B, is it closer to A, is it closer to C? I don't really know based on this data, but the dendrogram will always put it together with either A or with C. So we actually lose the information B is, is an intermediate between A and C. Um, we have some methods to visualize this and, and I have to say that I don't always see them used and, and I find that uh, a pity, but you have, uh, for instance, you can show error flags on the tree that uh, give you the, the standard error of uh, all the similarity values in the matrix, or you also have the cofinetic correlation, which is actually the correlation between a similarity matrix that you would derive from the dendrogram, so with less information than you truly have, and the real similarity matrix. The better this correlates, the better the dendrogram represents the complexity of your data set, the lower it correlates, the, the less it captures the complexity. So in these cases, if you would put a cofinetic on these branches, it would be very low. It would be around 50%, which is basically what you expect on, on pure random chance. So um, this dendrogram, it's clear that it doesn't always capture the, the variation that we want to capture. And it doesn't really answer the question, uh, can we uh, separate our data set? Can we distinguish between the, the, the two phenotypes that we, we want to look at or the species that we want to look at? So this is what the den what a example of a dendrogram look like based on the entire spectra. And here you see I have added no uh, control or, or nothing on, on the branches to show the quality. So where do you put a cutoff to say something is identical? Do you put it somewhere here? Do you put it here? Is, is this a cluster? Is Are these two different clusters? Um, they're all quite close together. Also, if you look at the similarity matrix, you actually have a few points where you can see that, uh, so this color is the similarity, so black means it's highly similar. So this one here is actually also highly similar to this first one, as well as this one to this third one. Um, so you can see that the separation is, is not that great. Uh, so where do we put our cutoff for our groups? And that you can actually check with here, I put a, both a cofinetic correlation and an error flag. And you can see that uh, these branches here have a really low cofinetic correlation. And this is because of these black dots that, uh, um, that mean that the groups aren't that well separated and that there are actually spectra in there in one group that is also similar to spectra of, of the other group. 
So here you can't really say that these three form a different group uh, compared to these uh, five. So it's, it's very important that you verify that and that you don't just take uh, a random cutoff. So then you have a dendrogram and you see that you don't really see a separation. You see that uh, your phenotype, so here I'm, I'm trying to distinguish between um, three different signals and I don't see it in my dendrogram. It's just all mixed together. Does that mean that I need to stop, uh, throw my spectra away and do some other research? It might, but it might not. Uh, because if this dendrogram was generated just based on the entire uh, spectra, there's still a lot I can do to check if there really isn't a signal that's specific for uh, my three groups. The ideal method to use there is, uh, is a linear discriminant analysis. It's a, a version of a principal component analysis. So a principal component analysis will calculate uh, different components uh, based on, on the data, so it will simplify your data um, in, in such a way that the first and the second component, it's, it's ordered towards the variation. So the first component captures the, the most variation of your data set. If you use a LDA, it won't capture the most variation in your data set, but between the groups that you have defined. So here between my three groups, the LDA will choose components, will sort the components that have the largest variation between uh, these three groups. If you see a cloud like this, it may be, okay, maybe you can state that there are a bit more red on this side and a bit more yellow on this side, but still it, it, it's a cloud. Uh, this is not something that you can use. Um, if you would want to, uh, and here there's very likely no signal in, in the data that we're looking at. So if, if you would want to check um, if you can still use MALDI, you would probably have to change your protocol or, or change your range or change something in your experimental setup. Based on this data, you cannot continue. Then you sometimes see this if you're very, very, very lucky, but uh, it's it's fair. So here you see that there's a very good separation of, of the groups. Um, the green and, and the, the blue are still uh, a bit closer together, but still uh, everything is quite far apart and well separated. But in most of the times you have something like this. Uh, so here we can see that the blue group is relatively well separated. The yellow group with some uh, mix between the yellow and the red. And then here, the red and the green group. Uh, I apologize for those color blinds. You won't be able to see it, but there's no distinction. So the yellow uh, and the, I'm um, sorry, the red and the green group, they are completely mixed. So in this case, if we would proceed uh, with trying to predict uh, these groups, we would probably uh, just put the, the red and the green group as one group, saying it's either red or green and, and not specify uh, the specific uh, color. So once you have, you see that you can continue with your linear discriminant analysis. Uh, so this is a bit more background on, on the method itself. So you use the data matrix, you don't use a similarity matrix as you do uh, with the dendrogram, but you go straight from the similarity matrix, try to reduce the dimensions in your data set in, in such a way that it e either captures the most variation or the most variation between your groups for the LDA, and then you visualize that uh, in a two-dimensional or three-dimensional way. So it's very important to note that um, it does not provide a hierarchical classification, so it does not make pairs and, and say which pairs are more related to other pairs. It just makes a, a plot and it does not separate the entries into groups. So for a dendrogram, we choose a branch and you say, okay, this is one group and the other side of the branch is the other group. So it really groups uh, your data. For uh, these type of data, it plots the data, but it's up to you to visually decide what is a group uh, and what is not a group. So you do uh, the grouping yourself based on the visual interpretation of the plot.
so once you decided that, okay, you can't separate between your phenotypes or between uh, whatever it is that you're trying to separate, so what are the next steps? Uh, because of course now you're still using a, a reference set for which you know what it is, so you would at one point want to apply this to strains that you don't know what they are. So then uh, you have two uh, options and you can even combine these two options. You either do a biomarker analysis to find uh, the peaks that are responsible or you train a machining learning algorithm um, that is a bit more powerful because it can also do combination of peaks or even combination of intensity of peaks as, as a signal to separate uh, the groups. So one simple uh, method is uh, using this data mining where you can normalize the data, you can log transform it, transform it so that you can uh, do an ANOVA on all the peaks and just see which ones are, are different, uh, selecting them based on the p-value. Uh, you can also confirm this uh, with, uh, with the heat map where you would cluster both uh, the entries uh, as well as the peaks and then see which peaks um, are specific for which groups and this all gives you potential biomarkers that you can then check uh, on, on a more extensive set of strains and spectra. Then with the machining learning algorithm, uh, so we call it in bionumerics, we call it an identification project. You can predict the groups uh, yourself. So you, based on a reference set, so here on the right you see your reference set, you have an unknown sample and you compare it to your reference set to identify it. And this you train the algorithm to do so that you don't uh, have to do it yourself. I checked a lot of different um, methods and, and algorithms. Um, there's actually somewhere a, a chapter with this figure in it. Uh, so I have the precision and the recall. And these data sets that I, I used, um, the data set B is, is, you can consider it as an easy one. So that's uh, like the, the difference between all species levels, so different species. You can already visually see that they're different and they're simple methods based on the similarity of the spectra. Um, naive Bayesian, they, they, all, they all work well. Basically, if you can see it by eye, any method will, will give you a good separation. And then you have the more difficult data sets where just based on, on the similarity, uh, you don't really see anything. Um, and then if you go to a support vector machine, so this last option, my, my bar shifted a bit, I'm sorry. So this is a support vector machine and that does give um, the, the best results and the best uh, precision and recall for, for most data sets. So you don't need to know um, very well what these different algorithms are, you can check their performance and see which one performs best on your data set. And I can tell you that for MALDI, uh, based on the intensity of the peaks, it works a support vector machine, um, works quite well. You have to be very aware of some of the drawbacks of these methods. Uh, so they are um, a bit of a work to, to set up and to train and to get the reference set right. But once you have them, um, they're very easy to run and to interpret. You can also run a certain amount of checks to see what you can and what you can't do. For instance, here, uh, this is an example of, of a validation of an identification product, um, project to uh, distinguish between different mycobacterium tuberculosis complex species. And we see for the Africanum and tuberculosis that it, it works quite well. But for the bovis, um, it actually scores better with, I, I think it's tuberculosis than, than with its own class. So here for the bovis, we do not get a good identification. So we, we know exactly how we can apply this identification project, which identifications or predictions are reliable and, and which are not. In the case of bovis, it's actually mainly because um, there are our reference set contained just a few bovis strains. Um, and it was mainly Africanum and tuberculosis, and that's actually one of the drawbacks of this um, support vector machine, that if you have a very large differences in group size, so you have a group with just a few strains and then a group with a lot, uh, then it will typically tend to, to assign it to the big group. There's also a, a risk of over-modeling, so if you have uh, groups that, that only contain 
three, four or five strains uh, spectra, and, and you're looking at the complete uh, set of peaks of, of like two, three hundred peaks, it will always find something in that data set just based on, on randomness that is specific for those uh, few strains. Um, and that will give you an over-modeling, which means that you're actually just looking at, at signals that, that uh, are, are due to chance and not due to a real biological signal. So your size of groups should be more or less the size of your data set. And if you have a very small groups, then it's actually best to uh, limit the data set that you would input into the support vector machines by, for instance, first doing uh, the search for the potential biomarkers and then just use those. Also a very, very important rule is uh, your reference set. Your um, identification will only be as good as your reference set. If you're using a reference set that is not representative of, of your true data, you will never get a good identification. It might look good on paper, but it won't work uh, very well. The, the golden rule here is really uh, garbage in uh, is garbage out. And this is where the biological knowledge is, is the most important. Uh, you as, as researcher, you're the expert, you, you know what is representative, you know which biases there are. Uh, so uh, this, this is really uh, biological work and much more important than, than any of the mathematics uh, behind uh, these methods. It's really the choice of the reference set. I know a really great example that I, I want to share with you, if I still have time. It's uh, on the X-ray of, uh, of the chest to identify lung disease. And uh, the machine learning algorithm was very good at predicting collapsed lungs, uh, which is quite difficult to do based on, on an X-ray of the lung. But then a radiologist looked at the at the reference data they used, and they actually used um, X-rays from after treatment of the collapsed lung. So when the lung was inflated again by inserting a drain, and of course the drain pops up really clearly on on the X-ray, but it has no diagnostic value whatsoever. And then any radiologist will will really easily uh, know this and would have already flagged this uh, ahead of training uh, the algorithm. So in conclusion, yes, Molly can answer other questions and species ID. I think other presenters have also um, um, convinced you of this, but it's not always easy and straightforward. You need to uh, be sure about your data. Um, you need to prepare your data very well uh, and you need to know uh, what you are doing. Um, all these methods that I described here have also been implemented in bionumerics. So the software platform uh, that we offer for, for all kinds of analysis of, of typing data from microbes, but they are also part of the public domain, so they are not specific uh, to bionumerics. So if you have any questions, uh, just go ahead and thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much, Katzen, for the presentation of bionumerics and all the application you can do. It was really interesting. Uh, we have uh, two questions for you. So one from uh, Nikia. Sorry if I misspelled your name. I think I did it yesterday too, so sorry about this. Uh, great presentation. I often work with bionumerics for subtyping. Is there an online training module for the LDA and machine learning? Um, yes, we do have a tutorial for that. So I can. you can contact me and I can send it to you. Uh, another one um, is from Marcus. Uh, does Kathleen recommend to use data from different labs to prevent lab internal internal based model, which will not work for external mass spectra, for example, instruments, operators, influences? Yeah, th this is the main question. I, I think this is also the reason why there is no uh, PulseNet or TESI for, for MALDI. Um, especially when you're strain typing, we have seen that the the protocol to prepare the strains and the protocol to get uh, to to the spectra um, is uh, is needs to be much stricter than just for species identification. So this is definitely a, a hurdle to compare between different labs. Um, I'm not even talking about different machines. I, I don't. I've seen one comparison uh, 
but that didn't even compare the strains, the, the spectra one to another, just uh, compared the results from both machines. Um, but that uh, that is something that should be investigated in a lot of details, and, and I doubt uh, that there will be a good comparability, uh, especially for, for these very weak signals. I think it's very difficult to get them out uh, with, with very variable sets, yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much, Kathleen. We're running a bit uh, much of time, so I think we should just shift to the next presentation, but thanks again for this really nice presentation. So our next speaker, which is in fact a keynote speaker, it's Professor Ray Cruz Ilse. So uh, he has a PhD in molecular pathology from the Barton London Hospital of Medical School. Uh, currently he's a clinical scientist, former university dean, and author of more than 150 peer review publications spanning reproduction to cancer. Uh, through recent advances in mass spectrometry, his team has developed techniques and expertise in proteomics and basis of biomedical startup companies pioneering post-genomic, faster, efficient, and cheaper diagnostic screening tests. So, Ray, please, the floor is your, for your presentation. Maureen, uh, thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction. And um, I, I'm, I'm smiling because this symposium has been fantastic. I, I feel I'm with my people at last. Um, every speaker, has said something extremely relevant to what I am doing and I feel really amongst the people who understand the kind of technology that uh, my colleagues and, and I are trying to promote and obviously you're doing exactly the same thing. Um, if I come into my talk I'm really going to talk about the work we've been doing over the last 12 months on uh, COVID, um, the identification of SARS-CoV-2 uh, but it is an example of how the mass spectrometer can be rapidly applied uh, and I think will be the biosecurity screen of the future for future pandemics. Um, I realised when I was putting this talk together that I put why and how the wrong way around and I'm going to start my talk with the why. Why is Multitoff going to be important? Hopefully this is going to go. So if I click first. Um, so why do we need a multi-TOF spectrometry test for SARS-CoV-2 and other viruses? Well, at the moment, or what was very fortunate, we had RT-PCR viral genome testing. And that really stepped in to uh, give a handle on this pandemic and um, essentially put everyone in the right direction to uh, get this under control and for us to actually monitor this outbreak uh, before the vaccines have started to come in. Uh, so it was our main way of knowing who was infected. Um, the problem is it's time consuming, we need specialist labs, costly, but it is highly sensitive and this is an issue that I'm going to elaborate on in the next few slides. Now what has been introduced is this uh, lovely little bit of plastic called a lateral flow antigen test. Uh, the use of the lateral flow in, uh, antigen test in the UK has skyrocketed uh, a little bit to the detriment of PCR and it's rapid, simple, cheap, but the trouble is it's got a low sensitivity. Now there is a bit of a joke amongst lawyers that there's nothing as, as expensive as a cheap lawyer. Um, I hope for people's lives that there's nothing as expensive as a cheap diagnostic test. Um, because what I'm going to illustrate to you is that what is needed is a highly sensitive test which can pick up people who are not presenting with symptoms. In particular, we want to pick up the asymptomatic. Um, asymptomatic are people who might have the infection, they're able to deal with it, but they pass it on to other people, some of whom will develop the symptoms and become ill. So you need a highly sensitive test, but at, at an affordable cost that you can screen entire populations. Now, another bit of an argument is, to be honest, I think 
to be reliable, it needs to be conducted in the laboratory, not by individuals. Uh, but this is my personal view. Um, but there is a real problem with this world, real world pandemic. Detecting the asymptomatics is a very difficult. Um, it is not something that can easily done by a bit of plastic. Um, and we also have imperfect data sets, as Kathleen was talking about, in that um, we use RT-PCR to define who is positive. Um, but it's not the perfect definition of who is infected or clinically infected with COVID or SARS-CoV-2 that they are going to spread it. Um, in fact, there have been very many studies and they're saying that <laughs> RT-PCR is great, it is a very, very good tool, but it's only about 85 to 90% sensitive in picking up all the people who subsequently develop um, symptoms from COVID-19. The issue of false positive had been largely ignored, but it, it's really come up. The reason is that we're all now starting to screen people who are haven't got any symptoms, they're not presenting symptoms, so we've got to look between to try and identify the pre-symptomatic and then that true asymptomatic population. And the estimates of this pre-symptomatic, asymptomatic population can range from four to 80% that are being identified by RT-PCR. But most studies will agree that RT-PCR, as it's applied to the general public, um, not necessarily presenting with any kind of symptoms, about 50% will be asymptomatic they will not develop the disease and we're presuming that they are able to spread it to others. So nevertheless, you know, we, we, we really need to do this. We need to identify the asymptomatics and the lateral flow device uh, has been sort of rolled out in the UK in particular and it's about to be rolled out in the US as sort of the rapid uh, screening technology to um, screen the entire population of people who do not have symptoms. Well, the problem is that this test was only developed and validated against people with symptoms in hospital. And when it started to be tested in real life, um, and in particular the Birmingham study, where they were looking at um, students, over 7,000 students, who did not have symptoms, they only picked up about three to 4% that were being picked up or should have been picked up by an RT-PCR RT positive test of the non-symptomatic population. So that is extremely disturbing. And in fact, the data really, really points this out. You're able to download the um, statistics from the UK government website, look at how the, um, what's called tier two screening is working, um, where the PCR test is looking for uh, primer pairs, looking at the M protein, or one AB, and then the S protein. Um, so we're going for three target gene sites of the virus, and you only need one of them uh, to score positive within the uh, PCR for you to be labeled as being infected with SARS-CoV-2. And there's also a big question about the kind of level that is being detected. And what has been shown on many, many studies is that the uh, lateral flow de uh, device will only detect high levels of uh, virus, uh, if it's present, at CT values less than 29, to be honest, uh, a value of about 26 is probably about the average for the lateral flow devices. So as you can see from this graph here, this is the uh, UK government's own uh, data from their, their surveying of, uh, um, random surveying of the population, that you're only picking up about 25%, maybe 30% of the people that are detected by the RT-PCR. And presumably these people here are more likely to be the asymptomatic population. And you're completely missing them using the lateral flow device. Um, one thing to remember that we are talking about huge log changes here that uh, every 3.3 um, additional cycles, you're moving a log difference in sensitivity. So if you're detecting at about a 
um, level of say 100 units, you're measuring in tens of units if you jump 3.3, and you can see how this rapidly gets your sensitivity down to very, very low levels. Um, and there is an argument with the RT-PCR that if you go onto too many samples, you're measuring noise, um, possibly environmental, of, of no clinical significance. So some uh, PCRs limit their, their CT value runs to 35, as we do uh, in Europe and, and the UK. In America, it's uh, 40 cycles. Now, the data really has shown that the lateral flow tests, when we looked at the cumulative data of all its uses of it, being used over 7 million tests have been reported, that it was reporting about a prevalence of about 1.1, uh, sorry, 0.1% uh, positivity. Whereas if you look at the equivalent RT-PCR data, it ranges from 0.3 to 0.6. And if I do the UK average, that's about 0.3. So it's not that the um, lateral flow detect uh, tests are detecting a third of all positives. It's what third is it detecting? And the third it's detecting is the uh, pre-symptomatic, the symptomatic fraction, and not the dangerous below the watermark asymptomatic infections, which would sink the Titanic. Um, it is not an appropriate test, and that's my argument. So, moldy top. How can this come in and and help and uh, be an adjuvant uh, high throughput screening test? Um, that can support RT-PCR? Well, the first thing we've got to do is actually think about what our target is. And it's really about the physical biochemistry, the biology of the molecule. And something that Kathleen was saying, that you really have to look at the biomarker you're going to be looking for. Now, unlike bacteria, there are no housekeeping genes. There are no naked small proteins, which will be characteristic that we've seen in a lot of the previous talks. Um, the virion particle itself, the really characteristic proteins uh, are glycoproteins, which are very large and embedded into the uh, lipid envelope of the virion particle. And these are the key activators, the key players in um, the infection of a cell, they will bind to a receptor, they'll be acted on by uh, other factors such as a proteolytic tri uh, trigger, which will activate the complex of the spike so that the viral nucleic uh, material, the RNA, can be uh, introduced and it can take over the cell. And as you can see here, this is an infected um, cell with um, um, a coronavirus. And you can see that it's completely taken over the cell function and what it's doing is making its own protein, i.e. the viral envelope proteins here, and there's quite a few of them, uh, creating uh, them embedded within the lipid, and then it takes copies of the RNA and produces little tiny vesicles like endosomes, which are packed to the viral particle, and then the viral particle travels to the cell surface, and we get millions of these viron particles released. Now, we uh, decided that Molitov can raise this cha uh, challenge. And uh, something Alex was saying is that, you know, we looked at the real life here. We couldn't grow um, our virus on agar plates and then pick a colony. Uh, we, we have to take them from clinical samples. So we had to consider several steps of developing a Molitov technique, so sample enrichment. Um, and so we were looking at either swabs or what we opted for initially is actually a gargle to try and get the mucus from the back of the throat where the virus should be in the uh, initial stages of infection. Uh, can we take a clinical sample, enrich the viral component? Uh, and then we had to consider, well, we've got a problem in that the proteins we're interested in are embedded within the viral plasma membrane, the lipid membrane, can we get those out in a, such a manner that they can be um, uh, then visualized on the mass spectrometer? Because if they're stuck within the membrane, we're never going to see them. So this is our first two challenges. And um, what we did 
was some very simple physical biochemistry. Uh, one of the things is just exploiting the physical size of the virion particle. Uh, if we add acetone, and we just add a one-to-one -one ice cold acetone um, to our biological sample, uh, we can precipitate the larger complexes, the larger molecules. Um, it turns out if you do a 50-50 mix, you are precipitating and enriching uh, into that pellet your virion particles, and you're leaving behind an awful lot of other smaller molecules, which would give you interfering signals uh, in your mass spectra. So we cleared an awful lot of smaller molecules. So once we'd got our enrichment of our viral particle, we then had to consider, well, how do we get out the characteristic proteins that we want to see in the mass spectrometer and get them into a mass range that can be visualized on the mass spectrometer? Now, we knew that we were didn't want to overprocess um, and we also realized that from our own experience we were looking at much larger molecules than everybody else has been looking at uh, in this conference um, we also had to change the matrix to look at these bigger molecules these glycoproteins uh, we can't use cinepinic uh, sorry chca we have to use cinepinic acid um, but we still had to try and break up and extract these proteins so we actually had developed a series of mass spec moldy mass spec friendly uh, detergents which will dissolve away the lipid membrane and aid in the ionization of these lipid loving uh, domains um, to, so we could actually visualize the proteins coming out and to make it a little bit easier for us we also reduced the disulfide bonds there's an awful lot of disulfide bonds here which holding the complexes together and holding some of the structures together and in particular this spike complex not only is it a trimeric complex that we could break apart with our detergents our mass spec friendly detergents but if we actually reduced it uh, with something like diethyl which we have been using up until now we could break the spike protein into several subunits um, typically people understand s1 and s2 what i'm going to show you is that actually there's many more triptych fragmentation of the S2B, and that's a very important biologically functional protein. Now, I'm just going to come back in that all I've shown you to date or, or, or so far um, is very relevant for looking at other viruses. Many envelope viruses, in fact, all of envelope viruses have some kind of spike or um, receptor binding complex embedded within the membrane. They're of different lengths and they have different endogenous and then subsequent cleavage points. So they all give a different fragmentation pattern. So this really gives hope that we can actually look at many, many different viruses using this technique. But I am going to concentrate on uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, for the purpose of this talk. Um, so to get all this developed, we couldn't initially start all the research uh, using live virus that would be dangerous um, there's so many conditions we had to adapt so luckily colleagues at Kent University and University of Cambridge absolutely brilliant people uh, were making pseudoviruses where they were um, had taken the uh, components for a lentivirus uh, they could introduce the spike um, complex into the uh, pseudo lentivirus and that would be expressed in culture and we would get produced into the culture media these sodo viruses expressing the targeted um, spike complex so we would treat it as if it's a uh, a biological sample our, our aim was to do a gargle sample and we could actually then look at the spectra and we were getting fantastic results from these pseudo viruses uh, albumin could get in the way of culture, which of course is not present in a gargle. You don't have albumin floating around in your uh, saliva. Um, but we definitely were picking up the S1 fragment, which we confirmed. We we're also picking up the S2 fragment, but sometimes that could be um, obscured by albumin. And then we were getting a host of the other large envelope proteins like uh, E uh, and M, the matrix ones. Um, were also coming up as a, a signature. 
Um, we then moved on to live virus. So we were getting the, the Wuhan isolate and the uh, isolate from uh, the UK. Um, these were being grown on cells and we started to play with that. We would take the culture media, not the cells, just the culture media where the viral particles were being shed into. Uh, we could spike it into gargle samples. And yes, we could see the S1 uh, uh, protein uh, in particular. Now, I'm just going to point out a little thing here is that we're getting very broad peaks. Um, the reason we are, because these are very large proteins which are glycosylated. So not only do we get a broadening of the peak um, because of uh, isotopic variation, because we've got carbon, um, nitrogen, uh, oxygen, and sulfur um, isotypes. So that really causes a big broadening of your peak as you get bigger and bigger and incorporate more of these uh, different elements with their um, um, is isotopes. But also we get variable glycosylation of these peaks as well. So it's, it tends to be very broad peak and we could actually see a difference in the glycosylation pattern from uh, cells which were grown on Vero cells. Um, so when that, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 was being propagated on uh, SARS-CoV-2. When we started to move into patient samples, we could see that there was a glycosylation difference and this peak was slightly higher. So it is a very broad and complex peak structures that we, we are getting on our mass spectrometer. So we have the basis of a test. Uh, sampling could be at home. Uh, it's just a simple gargle. Um, 10 mils of water turned out to be better than saline. Um, it could go to the laboratory where we would filter it to get rid of any bacteria. Um, and then we'd do the acetone precipitation, put it onto the mass spec, we'd get a spectra, and we could then start to identify the various peaks. And one of the most interesting things was happened when we moved into real biological samples is that notice that we were getting some extra peaks which were actually arising from the precipitation of the large immune complex molecules that you will find in your mucus, so IgA. And these were characterized as, because we were reducing the disulfide bonds, we could see the IgA light chains from the IgA heavy chain separating as well. And this turned out to be additional important marker because if you had viral proteins, you would have high IgA levels as well. So the elevation in IgA also told us that you had an active uh, infection. It wasn't just some kind of noise or something that was not active, not doing anything to the body, that we can actually see an immunological response in that mucus um, saliva sample as well. And when we came to analyzing the, the spectra, we could see um, viral envelope proteins that could arise from a number of different viruses, because you, you know, you've got a lot of bacteria in there, you've got lots of different uh, viruses that may be present. Um, you could see whether there's immune response from the IgA heavy chain, the IgA light chain, and then we were looking for the specific S1, S2, and S2-like um, fragments, which I'm going to elaborate on in a minute, uh, present in your spectra. Uh, and it would, you know, we could do a heat map. We were looking at the bioinformatics that would be needed. Um, we did some limits of detection to make sure that we were in the ballpark range of RT-PCR. Um, and using the 8020 um, Shimatsu instrument, we were getting down to the upper ranges of some of the EUA, the emergency use authorization um, PCR uh, tests in terms of their limits of detection. So we were in the range of what PCR tests were actually uh, detecting. So we had a good start. But as Alex had pointed out, there's a big jump between what we can show in the laboratory and what we can do uh, in um, real clinical life. There's a lot of development that had to be done. Um, what we've concentrated on optical uh, is the optimization of the different mass spectrometers and the data processing. Um, there is a lot more work that can be done on matrix formulation. We have just stuck with sinapinic acid, but we, I think 
that there are many other matrices that we should be trying to see if we can get better uh, quality spectra. But that's a, another project that we haven't even started. Um, what we wanted to do was to see if uh, the uh, basic technology that I've described could work on any mass spectrometer. Um, so clinically out there, we have the uh, BioMariu uh, essential, uh, the Axima. Uh, we have the new 8020 that was being produced by uh, Shimazo. And of course, there are many people out there using the Brooker um, uh, Biotyper, the, the Microflex. Uh, so these are the instruments that are already out uh, across the world. And we wanted to see if the technique could be worked or could be used on all these different platforms because there are differences, as pointed out. Every machine has its own peculiarities. Um, now, the first one that I'm really pleased to report, this is fantastic work. Uh, we are collaborators in Northern Illinois, uh, Professor Elizabeth Galliard uh, with her students, uh, Praj and Zane. Um, we sent over our protocol, all our reagents, what to do. They sent Spectra back to us. Uh, and they were fantastic in that they had a program where all the student athletes who were asymptomatic or should I say didn't have symptoms were being tested um, by nasal pharyngeal swabs um, and being scored whether they were RT-PCR positive or not. Um, surprisingly, 77 were RT-PCR positive and 10 of which had developed symptoms. So there was a large percentage of this asymptomatic population, which is the key population to look at uh, in this cohort that uh, Beth and her group were, were um, studying. Um, so the overall amongst that population, sorry, 12% were asymptomatic, there's 14% who, who came back PCR positive. Fortunately, amongst those 152 gargle samples were collected simultaneously with the nasal pharyngeal uh, swabs. And uh, Beth performed the uh, test that we were developing, um, first version of it uh, on the uh, Axima uh, instrument, and she very uh, grossly um, sent also the spectra back to us to sort of play with the mathematics of what peaks are important, which aren't. Um, of those 152, three were pre-symptomatic, so that was our sort of absolute control group in that we had to detect those at least. And then there was 57 RT-PCR positives, but they remained asymptomatic. They didn't develop any kind of symptoms. And then there were 92 RT-PCR negatives. Now, this is not a perfect yes, no situation. You know, the, the, please don't say RT-PCR is a perfect gold standard, but it is the best we have, the very best we have. Um, we started to try and tease out the true positive and infectious asymptomatics um, from amongst that uh, cohort by looking at the spectra. So in red here, we have the uh, people who did develop symptoms um, and the blue here are the, um, uh, the RT-PCR positives and the green are the RT-PCR negatives. Now, depending where you draw your cutoff, it could be here, or here, and um, we decided amongst all of this analysis is that we wanted to see that you had an immunological response, an elevated level of IgA heavy chain, and whether we could pick up uh, either the S1 or the S2 and its S2 derivative peaks, which I'm going to show you in a minute. Uh, and overall, we had about a 70% agreement with PCR tests, which is so much better than the agreement that was occurring uh, with lateral flow devices. And this is significant. So we can pick up all of the pre-symptomatics in agreement with um, the Abbott SARS-CoV-2 RT-PCR test. Um, depending where our cutoff uh, and where you want to set this, uh, because I think we're picking up a lot of noise. I think you know we might breathe in, doesn't take, you breathe out. There's a lot of environmental noise with um, with a viral infection that's going around in the air. Uh, we can get uh, varying amounts of positive agreement or negative agreement, depending on what your cutoff is. So back in the UK, um, without any UK government support, um, 
we looked at the data set that we were getting from Beth, uh, looked at what samples we were getting in the UK, and we started to improve the system. But the first thing is the data analysis and use of controls. Um, one of the things that we really came very clear is that uh, we need to have a positive control to make sure that the mass spec system is picking up these high molecular weight molecules. And we've got that. Um, we then uh, had to have a, a, a reliable marker of um, whether the sample given was sufficiently good. Uh, and we actually had that uh, similar to uh, something that Alex was showing is that uh, if we look slightly lower in the spectra, around about uh, 10 to 11,000 um, uh, Daltons, uh, you pick up uh, proteins which are associated with mucus. These are the uh, non-mucus uh, mucus associated proteins. They are heavily cross-linked with disulfide bonds and they hold the mucus together. Uh, and um, of course, because we were reducing everything, if we did not see these mucus associated proteins, then we knew that we were not getting a very good sample. But it also enabled us to do some other things as well, is that, well, that gave us a little bit of a handle on quantification. So we developed an algorithm uh, where we would sum the S1, S2 and S2 prime markers, which are markers of the coronavirus, uh, we would uh, normalize that against the peak intensities of these mucus proteins. Um, so we've got a, a normalization going on. Um, and it was sort of something equivalent to the PCR test uh, where they were looking at three different primer sets. Well, we were looking at three different markers. Uh, yes, only one needed to be positive, but it had to be above a threshold. Um, and our controls really started to get us a handle on uh, how good the sample was, if there was any detector drift, because you do get detector drift as you're going across many, many samples. Um, and we also had the additional um, control of, well, is there a oral mucosal immunological response going on as well as detecting these markers of the virus? So it's quite, uh, at the moment, uh, I, I'm quite pleased with myself, but uh, our, ourselves, but um, we'll see how things develop. Um, back in the UK, we did have access to a number of samples we were getting gargles from. One of the projects I'm involved in is looking at the immune response uh, using mass spec, uh, multi mass spec, um, for people who were uh, serologically confirmed um, and uh, PCR confirmed to have had. Um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 infections. Um, a large number of these were seriously ill uh, on the intensive therapy unit and the rest of the medical staff uh, had mild symptoms. Um, and we were looking at their convalescent uh, samples. We got them gratefully to give us a gargle as well. And we could look and show that, well, actually they're custard down in this bottom corner here where it came to looking for the coronavirus peaks and the Ig uh, heavy chains. That could be variable, there could be other infections going on, but basically we could set some thresholds. We also looked at 300 members of the general population volunteers between London and Bedford, just about the time when um, cases were surging within the UK, and we looked to see what kind of signal intensities we were getting from that population, and uh, that was quite interesting because the majority were down within the low cutoff threshold, but we could actually detect a number of people and the number of people we were detecting um, were consistent with the published uh, RT-PCR data uh, for the region uh, in that we should have detected something like of eight to 11 in our random sample. Um, we were indeed, depending on the cutoff, we were picking up between sort of 70% um, and 80%, depending where you draw, draw that cutoff values, um, which would match what would be the expected population of sort of pre-symptomatic, asymptomatic carriers within the population at that time. Um, one thing to note is that unlike the um, American series, that the, the uh, CT cutoff on the RT-PCR 
in the UK, as I think is the same in the rest of Europe, is 35, not 40. So it's got a lower threshold of um, uh, uh, detection. It's not got, uh, sorry, it's got a, um, a more conservative threshold for detecting a COVID-19. Um, we also looked at um, how this would perform on the Brooker um, biotyper, which is uh, very widely used across the world. Um, and this is um, great collaborative work from Erica and, and Julie in the UK. Um, they helped us um, with how we could get the data off uh, and analyze it as text files. Uh, we set up a different raster pattern because uh, we we don't sample a small number of spectra. We actually have um, many thousands of um, spectra accumulated per sample, and we have a specific well-defined raster pattern as we go across the spot, so we're able to put that onto the machine. Um, we looked at optimized laser, detector, pulse extraction settings, and they're all set now for the biotyper. Um, and we also looked at the uh, lens cleaning and uh, the infrared uh, source cleaning uh, system on the Brooker is, is, is very good at this. And we adjusted sample shots so that we could maintain high efficiency, that we weren't getting uh, over uh, splattering of, of um, sample matrix onto the primary lens, which can then deteriorate the quality of your spectra. And this is the performance of the uh, Brooker Biotyper. We also, <laughs> I should have added that we changed our buffer formulation slightly because we realized that DTT, although it was having a, a fantastic reducing activity, the, the activity of dithiothreotol uh, drops off with time. So if you're doing hundreds of samples and um, your dithiothreotol is out for a couple of hours, you'll find that its efficiency of reducing all of those disulfide drop uh, disulfide bonds drops with time and we moved over to TSEP and we were getting much higher reproducibility um, this very tight distribution again we were looking at seropositive convalescent patients uh, this time at six months obviously this is after we had done the work on the 8020 um, we've only have a few um, 88 in fact um, um samples from a uh, general population at a time when the incidence of uh sars cov 2 detection by rt pcr has dropped dramatically within the uk uh but we've got this nice clustering here and the one positive is here unfortunately you know we we haven't got control we haven't got that support to confirm which is rt pcr or positive or net not as we have in the us now we seem to have a system, um, and that system looks like we could have some uh, relatively straightforward um, uh, interpretation software. Uh, the bioinformatics seems to work. Uh, we've we've got the controls, but the emergence of variants are the critical uh, emergency that's occurring now in the world. And how would the multitoff analysis keep up with this? changing field this rapidly changing field in uh, this pandemic um, the variants all are interesting in that the variants are occurring within the spike protein and as you can see that we target the spike uh, protein subunits uh, seen on the mass spec uh, they are interesting in that they are seem to be clustering with particular mutations and these are associated with increased spread uh, and also with um, decreased antibody responses that they, they, they are having effect on the structure of that, um, that um, spike complex such that in some cases not recognized by some of the antibodies. Um, now we have recently just entered a, an agreement with some fantastic team uh, in Brazil and we're just about to start uh, our study uh, using the um, the developed Multitoff mass spectrometry test for this, uh, this viral infection uh, in Brazil. And we're particularly with this group, we are going to be looking to see how different the spectra is with these variants of concern, in particular the P1 variant. Um, now I'm coming back to biology and the structural biology. 
because this is very important when we're starting to looking for these protein markers uh, you know at, at limited levels of very small levels uh, within biological samples and how they might be changing this is the trimeric spike complex and we already know that there is a pre-priming uh, furing cleavage site here um, between the S1 and the S2 subunits. When binding occurs to the ACE2 receptor, we see that the entire S1 complex is drops off. So we have a trigger event exposing the S2 complex. Now the S2 complex suddenly changes its conformational shape in a dramatic sense. It's almost like an umbrella turning inside out. And suddenly it changes its shape and exposes fusion peptide, which binds into the membrane of the target cell. So here is the membrane of the virus. Here is the membrane of the target cell and the fusion peptide region has suddenly been exposed. It would be internalized normally, but a whole conformational shape has occurred. Uh, we think there's another cleavage site here, and very early on, using mouldy mass spec, we had surmised that there wasn't just an S1, S2 prime um, cleavage, this S2 cleavage that other people have recognized, that possibly there's another cleavage here that is responsible for these next stages of biological activity of this protein. Because once it's bound into the uh, uh, the S2 complex is bound via the fusion peptide into the membrane of the target cell. You see, there's another big conformational change where the uh, the upside down umbrella seems to pull backwards and folds back in on itself, so as to bring its own membrane bound domain and the fusion peptide membrane bound domain together, so that the nucleic acid material of the virus can enter into the cell huge conformational changes and i think there's a lot of cleavage events going on there um, this all dramatically changes how antibodies are binding um, and what is being recognized now during the second wave uh, that occurred in the uk uh, we were pushing our, our mass spectrometers to the limit to see if we could pick up asymptomatics this is a 60 year old asymptomatic we could pick up our S1 domain, our IgA. Uh, we could normally pick up the S2, which is about 71. And sometimes we'd pick up another one about 62, which we think is where there's this additional cleavage going on. And there's a, a much smaller fragment being released. Um, we started to see odd things, such as this one, where there's our S1, our broad S1 peak. There's all the other uh, viral envelope proteins, but that S2 has shifted in position. It's now at 66, no, 71. Now, we didn't know what's going on here. We, we need more samples. Um, and then suddenly we got this one, where this is a young female in her mid-20s, who's PCR negative twice, and, and then finally a PCR positive for uh, SARS-CoV-2, and was hospitalized and treated with steroids successfully. Um, but as we can see, we couldn't detect any uh, S1 or S2 fragments in the positions we would expect, but we're suddenly getting all these new fragments coming up in samples. Now, because we, we haven't had quite the coordination I would have liked in the UK, I haven't got RT-PCR data on this, uh, but it, this could be a completely different virus, or it could be... Um, a very interesting virulent new strain of um, SARS-CoV-2 that has arisen. But this just illustrates that we see the pattern changes on the mass spectral um, spectra um, when we start to run a gargle sample and look at it on the mass spec. There is very clear indication of a viral infection. I'm not sure what this is, whether this is SARS-CoV-2, which is a mutant, and we've got a different pattern now, or it's a different virus altogether. So the new studies that we are doing, um, we are hopefully soon going to be starting with Professor uh, Dr. Tim Garrett at the University of Florida, 
uh, looking at clinical samples, which will compare the Shimatsu 8020 with the Brooker Biotyper, looking at saliva gar gargles. But I'm very excited this study, uh, starting with Tavio, Andreas, and Alfonso uh, immediately um, in Brazil, where we're using the Brooker Biotyper and we're analyzing max swab samples where they have sequenced um the samples which are positive which had high ct values and we're going to look at a how we can pick up the p1 variant if that's very different and also how well this can impact on saving lives essentially in brazil so i'm coming back to why why do we want to do this why is Molditov going to prove to be important or i believe it's going to be proved to be important in what we're going to be facing in pandemics and future biosecurity. biosecurity. Um, the whole point is we want to do population screening of the people without symptoms. Uh, this is to identify the asymptomatics who may spread the uh, virus to others unknowingly, completely unwittingly, because that's how viruses are spreading. Now, you can look uh, for viral antigens via the lateral flow department, the sensitivity is probably too low, it's above the transmission threshold. RT-PCR is fantastic because it's way below the transmission threshold uh, and you're looking for the uh, genetic information, the DNA signature of that virus. What we're proposing is to look for the antigen and an immunological response, i.e. the IgA elevation that's occurring uh, within the sample. And we think that this is where Molditoff will sit uh, in terms of being able to detect symptomless, asymptomatic spread of uh, pandemic viruses. Thank you very much indeed. So thank you very much for the presentation. It was really interesting and uh, kind of really a uh, current problem with COVID, definitely. Uh, we have one question from the chat from Anna. So very interesting presentation. Thanks, you. Do you have experience performing MALI in the nasal pharynx samples directly from transport media? No, uh, we want to do this. Initially, <laughs> we were very hell-bent on just doing gargle. And we realized well, we're stupid. You know, we need to be looking at the same samples. We had assumed that the transport medium would destroy the protein. But actually, in some of the experiments we've done, very preliminary, it doesn't. We still see the proteins there. So we very much want to do that. And we very much welcome collaboration with groups across Europe to do this. Okay, so I have a, on my side, I have a few questions for you. I, I'm not a virolo virologist, of course, so but maybe my question will be a bit stupid for uh, the presentation. Uh, I, I just noticed that you were looking for really uh, heavy proteins. Uh, yeah. Like, you know, that normally we're looking at the 220 kilodalton range in bacteriology. What, did you investigate already this part of the spectrum or you not even try to look at it just to find some stuff in it? We, we, we did look. There are markers in there. Um, we, we And I think there's still mileage to look in the smaller region. Um, however, we, were, we really wanted to target this against the spike. And we, we really knew that we were dealing with the spike uh up in the higher mass range um it was sort of conceptually more understandable to a lot of people um we we have uh, I, although i feel like I'm, I'm with my people here they understand markers that you know it, it it's the uh, it's just a peak that is characteristic trying to sell that to the rest of the world is very difficult to people who are not involved in moldy and bacteriology they just don't get it yeah, yeah i can understand uh, in the meantime, we get another question from Thomas. Uh, how do you estimate the sensitivity liminal detection for patient sample? Okay, it was a really long question. In fact, there's a different question inside one question. <laughs> okay. I mean, you can read it at the same time, and I so. The clinical sensitivity, that is a real 
real issue. That's why we are the, the study that we've done in Northern Illinois is, is really key to that because we were comparing RT PCR results with our results on the same sample uh, on the same patient with samples taken at the same time. So we, we know we're equivalent to RT PCR um, when we're looking for the IGA response and the S1 marker. The other compliance type studies we did for sensitivity, they were in vitro and it's not real. And, and I totally agree with them. It's a real problem. You know, you, you can do a lot of compliance work on in vitro mock samples, but when you get into the real world, it's different. You get a different pattern and you really want to do the more difficult thing, which is looking in the real world. I don't, hopefully that's answered Marcus's question. Okay, and so the second part of the question, if only the immunological response or the general multispectral variation will be analyzed, how will it be differentiated from the overall infection? Um, it, it, yeah, we, we're not just looking for the immunological response. Um, it's the immunological response I in elevated levels of IgA heavy chain and in combination the um, spike coronavirus peaks have to be seen for it to score positive because what we've noticed is that we can find other virus peaks and in fact we did a wonderful study where somebody came in and gave the entire lab a cold and we saw rhinovirus peaks coming up and you get an IgA response as well but it wasn't coronavirus so that's why we were have to have the coronavirus spike proteins and the IgA response, the IgA elevated peak. Okay, so we also get last one question from Nikhil, really active person in the chat apparently. Uh, great work, Ray. Do you think a better resolution could be achieved in negative mass mode? Ooh, uh, <laughs> at the moment, no, but I haven't tried it. Um, I, and you know everything's in positive mode. The the a little bit of a sequence here. The buffers we use uh, to extract from the lipids because I think if we're in negative mode, we'll get a lot of lipids coming down and large complexes. So I, I my guess, though I haven't proved this, is that we're better off in positive mode at the moment because our buffers get everything to fly in positive mode. Um, we are using a detergent in there that is mass spec friendly. You can't do this with SDS, you can't do this with Triton, but the, these particular ones are very good. Okay, well, there's no more questions, so I think we should unfortunately close. Um, oh, well, sorry, there's one more question. Um, there's a, a, well, a remark from Maureen. Okay, it's more remark. Um, Ray, I've done some work on the detection of uh, COVID directly in the nasopharyngeal swaps using Maldetov with sample from Kenya. She will be happy to discuss about it. The, that would be great. We, we we really, you know, value our collaborations across the world. Okay, well, perfect. So, like I said, just a few seconds before, unfortunately, we have to close now the session. So, um, may maybe all the participants can all switch on again the camera just to say a last goodbye to people who just attend to today's session. Uh, well, people are still here. Uh, so yes, I, I would like to really thank all the speakers from yesterday and from today because we just gave really, really high value presentation and I think uh, uh, without you, the symposium will not be here today. So a really big thanks to you. Uh, also, I would like to thank all the people who just attend to uh, the symposium. There will be a lot of people registered. I was not expecting this. Uh, also, uh, but not least, I would like to thank people behind the scene of the symposium because you don't see them. But I would like to say really big thanks to Crystal. Maybe Crystal, you just switch on your camera and say hi, because she has been. Um, uh, be a part of the organization of this symposium but apparently she's a bit shy so she oh no she's here so thanks a big thanks to you crystal and also thanks to uh, two other people who work on this symposium uh constance and uh, estelle who have been part of the organization uh also but not least information um from uh, the symposium we get contacted by mgpi 
for the diagnostic journal and it has been uh, decided that a, a special issue will be open for uh, this conference. So it will be the What's Up with Models of Mass Spectrometry in Microbiology uh, conference special issue. So please don't hesitate to share the information and to submit to this uh, special issue. It will be the way to uh, keep us updated for all the last news on Malitov in the whole uh, microbiology field. So once again, thanks to all of you, and I hope that it would just create nice collaboration between uh, all the different fields. Well, thank you again, and bye. Thank you.